Hello and welcome to the Mary Rose. Uh, we are convening weekly whilst this shit show continues uh, because we have no life and we're pretty sure none of you do either. So uh, Alina is around but she's not because she's prepping for our crazy week next week. How many are we, re- are we recording in six days Alina? About 35. Okay get back to work. Love you. We have Kit who still appears to be in a hotel somewhere. Are you going to be made homeless Kit? Uh, no, the hotel is still open. I am, I'm fine for a little bit. Oh, excellent. Until you run out of money. And they do <laughs> Until I run out of money. Oh, I think you have various offers from this pub to go and uh, move in with people. But uh, yeah, are you still living on takeaway? I am. I'm living on basically burgers, crap and pot noodles. Oh, not, not, not actual crap, just, you know, generic crap. I'm so jealous. I started that, uh, you know, where they deliver the box with all the healthy food in? And I did a mindful chef. I've never seen so many fucking vegetables in one box in all my life. And all I want to do is eat something nice. Um, And it's just, I I literally feel like a fucking rabbit right now. Are you you farting endlessly, you know, celery farts and all that? Because that's, every time I've tried to do a box like that, I've just ended up just (laughs) gassing out the place. No, but it says so much about my state of mind that I ordered this on about the 28th of December when I was still midway through the Christmas binging, where you literally just do not stop eating for seven days. And it's like, oh yeah, I'm going to eat four more fucking Ferrero Rocher just because they're there and I can and it's Christmas. And so I ordered it feeling all self-righteous and everything. And then... um, lockdown happened and the box arrived and the only thing that made me excited was that in one of the paper bags there was a lime that I can have with my gunpowder <laughs> gin and slim lines on it that is where that lime ended up so there's something that's going to require lime over the weekend and it's not getting lime in it because I drank it <laughs> uh, I can hear Charlie laughing you're right Charlie yes on behalf of all the vegetarians and vegans out there I can totally relate um, the bar- <laughs> Yes, yeah, <laughs> and um, and also I got rid of all the chocolate. So I did the the box of Quality Street, got through it, went right, that's it, done. And now there is none. But then you got sick, so didn't make up for it by being healthy or doing any exercise. Did you? I know. I was like, yeah, New Year, gonna hit the ground running, gonna be positive, and then I got my first migraine. So that's They're two days gone for you, isn't it? Oh, I've, and I feel I still feel hungover. I feel like I've been beaten up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's strangely appropriate for my uh, my later um, pitch which is going to be good uh, and Beth is sitting there eating chocolate because she doesn't give a fuck I think that's pretty much as soon as anyone else mentioned chocolate she went oh and went and got some you're right Beth yeah I'm good. I mean life is too short not to eat all the chocolate and all the meat and all the good stuff so yeah I tend yeah. to there is like I do find the occasional little thimble full of meat in this box that's supposed to like make up for the fact that the rest of it is just it would feed like <laughs> like tinkerbell literally I, there were about five lumps of chicken in my chicken pad thai thing tonight um which was exciting uh chris why are you in a, a suit and a pullover I, well i was wearing a shirt anyway i put a jumper on because I, I can't afford central heating and i don't know i just <laughs> maybe because i'm two glasses of wine down i thought a tie was a good idea right i, I thought I'd, Marcus wanted me to wear the mankini, and I thought instead of dressing down, thing, I dress I'm up. Like, you can turn up to I don't know, it made... these now wearing a shirt and tie as you want, but no one will ever, ever think of anything else but the mankini. <laughs> I know. I was on the phone to my sister, and I said I mentioned it, and she went, "There aren't pictures, are there?" I was like, "Yeah, I think they hit Twitter." And she went, "No, no, no, God, no, no, no one ever wants to see that." So, but yeah. ironically, <laughs> uh, you've got a date out of it. Is that right? <laughs> or have you got a date? Well, we're not out of despite it uh, despite it I'm, I'm i'm hoping she hasn't seen them um and another friend of mine a female friend of mine has seen them she, well, i mentioned it and so she went off on twitter and googled them um yeah sam if you're listening i i, I still hear the laughter um but yeah no the, the, the other person hasn't hasn't seen them so it was quite good, good for you that you seem to be leaning forward and clenching a bit so it made you look like you had pecs <laughs> that might be, be <laughs> rather than man boobs <laughs> That's probably yeah. just because he didn't have his heating on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we have Kate Spooner with us as well. All right, Kate. Hello, I'm good, thank you. It's pouring with rain. It seems to pour with rain a lot where you live. Is this just like a fallacy about Spain being awesome and warm all the time? No, no, no. Yeah, it's all it's all lies. The rain in Spain falls everywhere all the time. 
<laughs> brilliant uh, it's horrible uh, honestly we've got like this cold i don't know some sort of storm and cold and everywhere's getting snow except us we're just getting rain Ooh. and uh are you still pretending there's no covid yeah yeah we're still pretending there's no covid but we have to pretend within our own town now we can't leave our own town i can stay inside la linea which is the, like the town where i live um so it doesn't really affect me it just means i can't go to the next town to go shopping um so we can only spread it between our our like own little village which is nice excellent we also have with us who else have we got we've got locky with us you're right locky yeah good um but this time a couple of weeks ago you were playing rugby it's a bit surreal isn't it yeah and it is um, never, never nuzzle anyone's testicles again no we we kind of I, I can't even nuzzle my own testicles unfortunately i'm left to um kind of running which i you know everyone hates running anyway but me as a 20 stone man really really fucking hates running um but my brother's set a stupid challenge which is 200k by the end of january so and you I'm can't be beaten him. by your brother. No, little brother. Oh, I've got oh, no. Oh, so get running. Little brother, bless his heart. He's only six foot four. <laughs> oh, this guy's <laughs> the midget in the lobby household. We also have Clive with us. You all right, Clive? I'm all right, Alex. How are you? Uh, yeah, apart from wanting to just eat a massive burger after four days, <laughs> it's fucking mindful. I don't know who's mindful on it. It's not me. I've been angry all week. How is North London? North London's very exciting, except I hardly go out of the house anymore, so I can't really testify to what it's like out of the window. It's probably the best place to stay in North London, inside. I like that you've got the disco lights as well going on tonight. These are special disco lights. They're kind of bouncy ones, and they're noise-activated. Oh, brilliant. So they're going to dance every time you talk. Absolutely. I hope no one's got kind of epilepsy or anything that's going to be set off. I, I guess... Uh, no, it, <laughs> our, our one epileptic person isn't here tonight, so yeah, we're good. We also That's have good. Boney as well. You are right, Matt? How are you doing? I'm very well, boss. How are you? I'm not bad. Your uh, latest podcast is doing very well. What is it? The Battle of Bardia. Yeah, which was which was quite fun because I knew nothing about it, but it's got a, a fantastic Canadian at the central part of the story, Ray, Raymond Colley Shaw and uh, his exploits in the First World War and then in Russia, which we should do something about as well. Yeah, we definitely should at some point. But we are so, Holmes, you're not judging tonight, are you? I'm not judging tonight, actually. It was a, I follow the usual process I do when I'm just about to log in. I've got my little notebook out and pen and everything, and I thought, fuck it, I don't need them tonight. Yeah, I've noticed that the bar snacks have gone down considerably since lockdown was announced. Yeah, but actually, we've been up for two weeks. That's better than, better than we were averaging in the summer. Yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, yeah, so you're going to actually take part today, aren't you? I'm going to I'm going to take part. Yeah, I'll, I'll do I'll do five minutes and fuck off like Alina normally does. That's what we do. <laughs> five minutes. <laughs> Give her too much credit. And uh, also, right. you know, I've, I've not done a Clive this week as well. I've not been whinging on our chat about how judges are biased and stuff like that. I've not well, tried to do any unfair influencing influencing or anything. We've got good judges this week. Well, you say that, Clive, but I feel they're both going to be biased because just for shits and giggles, we picked the two most unsporty people because we are doing history's greatest sport, sporting moment this week. So we've picked Zach, who literally couldn't give a fuck about anything that makes people sweat unless it involves a washing machine. And Princess, who basically <laughs> only likes sports like polo or whatever else they play down in the, his posh part of Kent. Uh, so you all right, guys? How are you doing? Yeah, heads down for the final chucker, what, what? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, like, if I see anything other than, like, you know, kids trying to learn to play something decent, like field hockey, it just kind of fills me with sadness. It's just boring. I, I remember the, the Football World Cup, not the World Cup, because there's, like, even World Cup of ballroom dancing um, being on, and having to, like, turn my back to TVs everywhere I went. So, yeah, I am pretty bitter about sport. I'm never sure quite why, so... um so this should um, be fun for everybody. <laughs> yeah, so this would be good. So this is this would be fun. Any hockey or something involving animals, um, they're pretty screwed. And Zach's just as bitter. So yeah, Zach. See, see, unlike Marcus, I know why I hate sport, and it's all You're to do with that. Well, yeah, partly I was shit at it, but I, I had one of these PE teachers. Some of you might know the type that I'm talking about, who would wear kind of shorts that were three sizes too small, even in the depths of winter. 
and was just that little bit too keen to demonstrate exactly how a rugby scrum should be done which therefore involved hands going in places where they really shouldn't be going. Oh, see, we um, had the middle-aged or slash old-age pensioner lady teachers with the tiny netball skirts who didn't vacate themselves after you'd all been in the showers. From the mm. yeah. My mother taught at us in a school where the PE teacher was nicknamed Plastic Dip because he wore a tight tracksuit all the time, making it look as though he'd been dipped in plastic. <laughs> and some, graf some graffiti went up on the wall saying plastic dip is a wanker <laughs> like a few days later it said plastic dip is a great as a big wanker and the rest of the staff were convinced that he put the big in <laughs> oh brilliant one, okay. one thing about PE teachers because someone explained why do PE teachers also teach geography because I don't see it's any true. correlation between kicking <laughs> a ball and That'd long shore drift <laughs> PE teachers that's weird that. that's true yeah, they all do. It really you. is. It's because they're not real subjects. You know, kick a ball around, here's where France is. It's done. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so we you did advanced Chris level geography. Before the <laughs> <laughs> uh, we also have with us today, and he was kind of like, I don't really have anything to say for this topic. And I was like, nobody cares. Nobody cares. They just want you down the pub because coming live from the great state of Georgia, which started this whole <laughs> fucking mess by electing <laughs> two Democrats to the Senate this week. John, are you still in one piece? I, I'm, I'm doing fine. What's, what's going on? I hadn't heard anything about that. <laughs> um, uh, you, your biggest hero now is the guy with the bear, the horns and the bear <laughs> bikini. Isn't it? Yeah, that's, that's, uh, I mean, it, we were, we were talking about, uh, uh, you know, somebody, a uh, man keening up, but, our guys over here, because it's winter, are taking it to a whole new level. There was a, 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 I had to check to make sure I hadn't like had some bad bourbon before watching this. I thought I saw a guy with a bison hat and a Chewbacca bikini, like prancing around in Nancy Pelosi's speaker chair at, at the U.S. Capitol. And um, according to a couple of friends, I, I wasn't hallucinating. No, um, he's front and center all over the UK coverage. Yeah, and, and not only that, what the, one of the many, many fucked up things about this story is that the election in Georgia, which flipped the control of the Senate and flipped control of Congress over to the Democrats, didn't really have much to do with the fact that Bear Man was running through our capital. He was already there because they didn't know the results of the election then. Uh, so he had planned on showing up there anyway. It was already on his calendar invite. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know, all the weird stuff there was was actually two different weird things at the same time. And as, so uh, I, don't, I don't know if anyone noticed, but he seemed to have, have drawn the silhouette of a cock on his on the right hand side. <laughs> the worst tattoo ever. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was there was some, yeah, some sort of bizarre like art there that, I, I'm not really sure why you would want to have to, to display like uh, identifiable information. Uh, there was another guy who was a, a sort of looked like a leprechaun from the office, maybe, <laughs> uh, who showed up and he was walking around with his work ID badge, like. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and he was a, it was a defense contractor. So there was a press release from the contractor saying he'd been fired immediately. You know um, what I loved? Uh, my personal favourite was in all of the pictures of Bear Bikini Chewbacca dude. There's this guy with a, I think he's the guy that's got the Confederate flag as well. But he looks like, if that guy isn't isn't related to all of his relations, at least five different ways, I, I mean, he just, he is a walking advert for inbreeding. And he's just sort of there zoning out with this blank expression on his face. Like, I don't understand how he managed to get to Washington. I don't understand like he doesn't <laughs> look like he has the intellectual capacity to have got from point a to point b let alone be strolling around the capitol building with a confederate flag you know <laughs> he was he was undoubtedly swept up in the moment um the other other flag that i'm still trying to drill down on and hoping that it is not a photoshop that it is real somebody googled georgia flag capital C. <laughs> and there's a picture of a guy with a Trump flag and underneath it is a Georgia flag, but not the state of Georgia, the Republic of Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> How they got there is beyond me, but you know, maybe he hitched oh, yeah. a ride with West Virginia. 
my, my the West Virginia guy, my theory is he was just harmlessly coming out of Arby's and climbed in the wrong car. And that was how I ended up at the Capitol building. That's the only thing I can think of is that he literally went into Arby's for something to eat and just mistakenly got in the wrong car and ended up as part of a coup. Because there's no way there was a thought process with that guy. No way. Can you, can you imagine that was the first time he was ever out of his own county? Yeah. Uh, and now he's suddenly in Washington. You know how Obi-Wan Kenobi senses a disturbance in the force and knows that Alderaan has been blown up? I think it was something, some kind of force vibe going on there that, that attracted some of these characters. I so just know what result... the, the running thing is, that I reckon there's a correlation between having that force and sense and the amount of cornstarch that you've in, <laughs> in your lifetime. However, well, the Dr. Pepper Mountain Dew all the way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The cornstarch is consumed as a liquid usually um, and, uh, and, and sometimes can induce blindness, I've heard. The, uh, but the end result of this, of course, is that now for the next couple of weeks, we've got to listen to the Germans telling us how to adhere to democratic processes and uh, uh, to avoid uh, a putsch attempt. So, and with Boris, always embarrassing. Boris Johnson shaking his head in dismay at you as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we're a hot mess right now. Um, I, I've heard us referred to as a nervous nine-year-old holding a live hand grenade. And, uh, you know, all I got to say is, uh, you know, we'll see what uh, we, we got one week down of 2021, 51 weeks to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, but hopefully only two weeks left before one particular very large, very orange uh, problem is removed from the equation. Yeah, I mean, Pelosi is now screaming uh, for the 25th. He's not allowed a Twitter account now, but he's still got nuclear codes, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And probably someone's Twitter account he can borrow and uh, log in on. Um, yeah, that, it, that, that is one of those things that it, it was, I think, last talked about with Nixon in, in, in any kind of serious way. It gets thrown around. It got, uh, with Ronald Reagan, it got uh, tossed about as a you know, senility thing. Um, I, I think most of the thought is uh let's just wait it out he's been tweeting today or and he actually did tweet before his his uh, uh his account was was cut off um that there needs to be an orderly transition of power um you but know. one that he refuses to go to refuses to leave the letter i'm presuming and refuses to do a transition with well as as we pointed out though in his defense John F. Kennedy did not attend Lyndon Johnson's inauguration either. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, in fact, none of the Johnsons had their uh, their predecessors at their uh, inauguration. But yeah, it's it's going to be kind of uh, it'll be. And wrong. Trump is a massive Johnson. Yeah, this is true. <laughs> so it, and, and I think I think he he all was always the type of personality that when things went wrong, every ally was going to desert him. So. Oh, the the other problem we got, though, is that this has been a long tit-for-tat kind of back and forth of bad behavior that's just gotten worse and worse progressively. So, you know, I think Trump will be gone, but the next president's going to have to deal with more, uh, you know, more of this kind of stuff um, until we, we get enough people raising their hands and, and basically saying, look, the other guy got elected, but he's my president. And uh, until we get that sort of attitude and, and chunk the partisanship, we're screwed. Yes, exactly. Is there a provision that if this continues to get worse and worse and worse and uh, um, you can't govern yourselves properly, that you will um, return to the crowd? No, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've already been looking at real estate in Scotland and... Uh, <laughs> I, I, and, and possibly Western Ireland, the farthest farthest part away from Dorman. So uh, yeah, you know. go, go to Cork. Dorman will never go to Cork. Yeah, Dorman is not here tonight because uh, he he has no asshole left over after those um, fast snacks last oh. time. It's it's Absolutely. not fake news. That's for sure. Not at all, but no, Chris. Although there is one serving member of the US military who's been on this podcast who did message me and say, can we come back now? 
<laughs> not gonna name them because <laughs> I don't want them to get can we be can we be part of the empire again was the question so. can you imagine there's there's nations that are now like liberal democracies like well use the word liberal sparingly but like Iraq that uh, America's bombed into democracy who looked at the news the last night and were like oh that's embarrassing <laughs> I, I think we'd be okay petitioning to come back. The question is whether the queen has enough uh, change under the couch to uh, deal with our little uh, national debt problem. John, we'll help you out here. Uh, route is when you run away. Route is what a uh, party walk. We'll, we'll, we'll English size you. It's going to help. Okay. <laughs> we, we already had a, uh, a down the pub where uh, some of my uh, English slang pronunciations were uh, correct, so I'll I'll just keep it. <laughs> That's true. And there was another one a couple of weeks ago where you thought that we had um, gay shamed Zach, I think. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, we were like, yeah. no, that slang for something else. Oh, oh you're right. It was it, you said you said uh, Zach, you're looking very straight today, and and it sounded over like you were saying you're looking very straight today. So, yeah, I remember. <laughs> and, and you were surprised with the way you said it too. <laughs> Is that why he's got his little beard now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> little being the operative word. Is this because your washing machine thinks you look sexy with stubble? <laughs> I'm unavailable for comment. Is that your way of saying fuck off? Basically, yes. Do we actually have this debate about sporting things? Should we actually? I mean, this is what, <laughs> laughing at the news, but yeah, it's up. But yeah, fingers crossed. Anyway, you're like ten hours by road from Washington, so the chances of you falling into the wrong car at Arby's and ending up in Washington, hopefully, you've got time to realise before you end up in any trouble, John. Well, the the only two people who will be going up to Washington from Georgia, I suspect, are uh, Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff, the new senators. So. We'll see. See how it goes. <laughs> Your mic drop moment. Okay, right. Let's do sporting greatest moments. Let's start with someone who's going to take it really seriously because they do love their sport. So let's go to Clive, my fellow. Oh, crew. jolly good. I do like doing it early because it gets. I can then relax and listen to everybody else's rather than preparing mine throughout. So I'll do this unprepared. When you talk about sport and tough, tough sport, one of the toughest endurance things that most people can think of are cycling's grand tours. The Tour de France, the Vuelta d'Espagne and the Giro d'Italia. And yes, Alex, you can make rude little signals down through um, on the camera. But I'd just say that Charlie the... was completely down with the rude little gesture of the cycling at Southern <laughs> Marcus. Oh, this is sport. You try getting punched by a heavyweight. Anyway. Yeah. I, I just, Clive, I okay. think in our defence, in... we don't hate all cyclists. We hate London cyclists. OK, well, this is, we're not talking about London here at all. But the Tour de France, for example, they go for 21 days, 21 stages, over three and a half thousand kilometres, eight days in the mountains. They cycle at an average of around 28 miles an hour. It's a really gruelling, tough event. But those events are nothing compared with the transcontinental race. With the Grand Tours, they have hotels, they have support teams, they have massages, they have their own chefs, they have mechanics, they have doctors, they have two rest days, they have everything they could possibly need to look after them. The transcontinental race doesn't go for uh, three and a half thousand kilometers. It's about four to five thousand kilometers. It doesn't have 21 stages. It has one stage. It doesn't have set routes. Cyclists have to navigate their own way, just calling in at three selected checkpoints on the way. But those checkpoints are always bang at the top of a really gruelling mountain with a compulsory parkour for the last 20 miles or so, taking them often over unbuilt, unlaid roads, which puncture tyres and buckle wheels. The transcontinental race is normally won in between eight and ten days. Cyclists set off carrying all that they'll need, other than the food they buy at motorway uh, service stations and things like that on the way, or McDonald's, and they just ride and ride, sleeping in ditches, bus stations, washing in McDonald's lavatories, whatever. 
It's a grueling and nasty race. People have died doing it. People have been very injured doing it. Nowadays, there are two and a half, sorry, 250 people set out each year. Fewer than half complete the course. It is one of the nastiest, cruelest races, and it's fun to watch. All of the riders carry transponders, and you can follow the little dots as they move in, across Europe. Originally, it went from London to Istanbul, then moved to Belgium to Istanbul. Then after the Turkish um, coup a few years ago, it moved from Turkey, sorry, from Turkey to Greece as the end point. And then in 2019, it reversed and went north from Bulgaria up to Brest in France, but still sticking to the same distance and still being extraordinarily grueling. The, the race was founded in 2017 by, sorry, by 2013 by Mike Hall, who was a veteran endurance rider who had ri ridden and won a number of different endurance races around the world. Sadly, in 2017, he was killed in the IndyPak race between the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean going across the south of Australia. The first winner was Christophe Algert of Belgium, who won it again in the second year, followed by Josh Hibbert in the third year. And then Algert won again in the fourth year. But in the third year, a guy called Mark Hayden from London, a London cyclist, yay, rode it for the first time when he was 24 years old. In that first year, Mark went, went way out into the lead and went through the first two checkpoints a good distance ahead of the second place rider. Josh Hibbert. Unfortunately, by the time he got to the third checkpoint, not having slept for more than 20 minutes at a stretch all the way, his neck muscles gave way and he basically couldn't lift his head up at all. So he got a carbon post and strapped it to his head and around his chest, uh, on, onto his back but with uh, gaffer tape going around his chest and tried to cycle on with his head strapped up but it didn't work and he had to give up. But not being downhearted, he did it again the next year, except that he then got pneumonia by the time of the first checkpoint, had to spend two days in bed before getting back on his bicycle and coming in in third place, eventually overtaking lots of other people. And then having worked out exactly how it was done, he won the fifth and sixth installments of the race. But it's the seventh installment in 2019 that I want to talk about. But something quite special happened there. Mark Hayden didn't compete, but instead, a young German woman, 24 years old, rode her first endurance race, and six hours ahead of the nearest comp competition, she completed the transcontinental race as winner in 10 days and two hours. This was an absolutely amazing feat. Firstly, to do it in your first race, but secondly, for a woman to show that women can compete in the, most, in the most difficult, the toughest endurance cycling event out there. When there has been debate for years about a woman's Tour de France being raced, there's been debate for years about equality and pay and in prize money for, for women cyclists. She was able to show that women can beat men at the toughest end of the game. Fiona Kohlberger, Binger isn't even a professional cyclist. She's a cancer researcher. And she got on her bike and she rode that race and she won it. And to me, that was one of the most exciting things I've ever seen in the world of sport. It's one of the greatest achievements ever in sport. And put, uh, put me down for that being the greatest sporting moment that I've witnessed. Thank you. Do you know, I was ready to crap all over that, and then you got to the point, and I was like, oh, she's that. But then you said that there's no actual path, right? So is there a chance she just can cut off two and a half thousand no, kilometers? They, just for shit? they all have transponders, and you, you follow them throughout, and you can see exactly where they are at any time. Yeah, because she's not just like tie it to a donkey and send that round or something, or put it on someone's car. There are, uh, there is a control car that goes along, there are photographers going along as well. So people do, would get seen if they were doing something absolutely dodgy. But also, there's no prize money. There's not even a medal or a cup or anything. 
It's just done simply for the honour of winning it, or in fact the honour of finishing it, or indeed the honour of taking part in the first place. That sounds like complete shit. That sounds like when people ring me up and say, will you do this bit of work? It would be great exposure. And also, didn't that Indian bloke that we talked about a few weeks ago who cycled to Sweden to meet his wife, he'd already done this. He didn't race, though. He was just strolling along on a big old rickety bike and he was probably stopping off in nice hotels on the way. I do like the idea of, so I, I learned that actually doing a muck poo is a thing because I, I will always look for a McDonald's when I'm traveling if I need to go to the toilet or whatever. But the fact that they've utilized it to the extent that they literally go and like bathe in the McDonald's washrooms and that is quite special. But what do our judges make of this? Let's start with Marcus, who despises London cyclists with a passion. Well, yeah, Clive always complains about the judges. So we've got two different judges tonight, and I've made it abundantly clear in my couple of weeks of like working through lockdown that London cyclists are just some of the worst because they will cut you up and then complain that uh, when they go through the red light that they almost run over. Uh, and that's not just some of them, but nearly all of them. So I wasn't quite sure where Clive was going until he got to the race, which was fantastic. So I thought it was going to be Tour de France which was going to be difficult with all the drugs and cheating. Uh, and then we got to the end and I was thinking, oh, I was actually quite, I'm quite impressed by the achievement, especially first woman to do it. That's really commendable. And then he shot himself in his own tyre by saying there's no prize, there's no ceremony, there's no medal, <laughs> yeah. there's no beating point to it. He's massively superficial and you've just told him he doesn't even gain a gin and tonic for doing this. He's like, fuck that. And they, in there, what do they get? They... Client gave us a long list of preparations, their support staff, their doctors, and then a two rest day, because that's what you really want in a sporting event, two days in the middle to do bugger all. It's really good spectator sport whilst they go that's into their McDonald's. So I'm not quite well, sure no, the audience like, that, are getting a lot out the, of this. Marcus, Marcus, you weren't, unlike Holmes, you weren't listening. Holmes is a good judge in that way. He always listens to everything. <laughs> <laughs> the two so the they next have week. Rest, two the France where they have rest. Tour de France where they have rest days. The beauty of the transcontinental is there is no rest days. There's no Some rest days, just McDonald's. 10 days to finish it. The, the last rider across the line took about 28 days to finish it. I bet they felt everyone had gone home by that point and they felt really stupid. All those few people that remain around to clap the losers at the end have gone home by that point. <laughs> uh, Lockie's just pointed out that when you go into McDonald's for a McPoo or a McShit, and you say to the staff, I'm going to buy something on my way out. That's a McShit with a side of lies. <laughs> <laughs> I think we used to serve that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I actually refused someone what? access to the toilets until they bought something. <laughs> when did Zach work in a McDonald's? This is and a revelation. Chris, when did Chris, did you say you refused someone access to the toilet till they bought something? What did you make them do? Take a <laughs> cheeseburger for a shit with <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we, we had the control because uh, we shut upstairs. We only had the, the downstairs toilet and we had the lock um, on the, uh, uh, at the, at the front desk. And so when they were trying again, it's like, mate, if you don't buy something, um, I'm not opening the door. So buy a cheeseburger or bugger off. <laughs> Then, then he got angry and violent, so I just opened the door because like, I'm not dying for this place. <laughs> <laughs> Zach, you've worked in McDonald's as well. I have. Um, that's how I paid for my MA, um, yeah. by being self-styled Lord of the Fries, because oh. I was the only person who was prepared to stand there and sweat my bollocks off. Quite. I was a grill monkey. Oh, grill <laughs> monkey's still prepared <laughs> fry boy. Do you know what, though, as well? I love that about you, Zach, because you would have gone, yeah, I'll take that because I don't have to talk to anybody. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's why I took the right kitchen. The <laughs> I also got to shout at people when they didn't tell me that they wanted 13 boxes of fries for whatever stupid order had come in. Um, so it, it was quite kind of therapeutic in that sense as well. I was the only person who could get away with shouting at a manager for being a twat, which they were about 90% of the time. Excellent. I worked in Anyone pub else? kitchens for a while. Yeah, no, yeah, pub kitchens, which, yeah, if you're in a closed kitchen, like you're upstairs or something, it's fine. You can turn the air blue when something goes wrong. Uh, yeah. There's at least a couple of my pubs which were open kitchens as well. So when the staff comes along and says, sorry, I fucked that order up. I actually want this, that and the other. Um, then you need to say, 
We uh, we used to refer to all of our <laughs> pub chefs as ping chefs because basically they used to love that because basically the ping of a microwave is all you ever hear in a pub. <laughs> but uh, they hated that. But yeah, I I would never ever have gone in one with an open kitchen, especially around Christmas when you literally mm. uh, Lockie's going to know what I'm talking about when you've got 65 drunken whinging people all wanting a roast dinner and your fucking kitchen is being precious about how many Brussels sprouts they got out of the freezer and you just have to go in there and scream the place down until somebody gives you more Brussels sprouts. Something will always go wrong with a big kitchen with big Christmas bookings as well it's just and you have to bodge something in an open kitchen it's like are we being watched? And then you want to say to the person the self-styled office Nazi that has done the planning and has the list because the list means shit when they've all started drinking and they've all pre-ordered a fruit salad but then they see the chocolate tort on the day and start lying about what they fucking pre-ordered so there's never enough chocolate and there's fruit salad everywhere there's always someone in your face giving you shit about how you got it wrong and it's just like look you need to understand that you bought 55 people to a pub and paid 9.99 each for a roast fucking dinner if you're expecting it to be warm out on time and fucking for the gravy to taste of something then you're living on a different planet i'm sorry 9.99 I yes. once had a woman uh, uh, um, uh, Alex, to call the police uh, on me. What? I'm not Alex, having enough cake. helping you work out these frustrations. <laughs> Hang on, How long Chris, have you been did you say a woman once threatened to call the police on you because you ran out of cake? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, 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 after, after McDonald's, I worked for um, my university cake, catering department and we had um, 300 um, foreign students come in for uh for a meal and um we had um enough desserts for 300 of them but there was cake for like 150 then yogurts for 100 and fruit for 50 and then we had another booking of um 20 people coming in afterwards and we'd saved enough cake so that we could offer them cake and um after all the um foreign kids had left in came this nice group and they sat there they had the three course meal and this uh instructor from the first group walked past looked through the window and saw them eating cake I went ballistic and she came running in and she started screaming at me in um, a very broken English and Italian accent. You stole cake from these children. How dare you steal cake from these children? It's like, I was like, I haven't stolen anything. And she said, I am going to call the police. I went, please do. Please do. She went, what? I said, please call the police. I would love to speak to a constable right now. So, it's always that I, I will... when a very large person in a paper crown is screaming at you about how there must be one more slice of fucking oh. chocolate cake somewhere in the building. And you're like, yeah, but that one final slice is my reward for this 20 hour shift of hell. <laughs> yeah. I'm not fucking <laughs> handing it over. So the one reserved slice, you ain't getting it. Anyone else want to vent about the catering industry while we're here? To <laughs> I've made children cry. Good feeling, isn't it? I was um, I was making millionaire shortbread, and you know, you, you demo and you cut it up, and then people come up and grab pieces, and they're kind of throwing their children at you like this is, you know, like I'm like I'm the Red Cross or something, and they're, they're throwing the children, and all the all the shortbread's gone in minutes, and then there were tears. Do you know what Kate's just said? I was the twat with the list. That's why I always printed name tags. I'm like, Kate, do you know what those name tags mean by halfway through the meal? They mean shit because your comments mm. will just lie. You'll have some fat bloke in front of you that thought it was sensible to order the fish course and a fruit salad eight months before when you made the booking. And he'll still be telling you till he's blue in the face that he ordered a chocolate cake whilst trying to hide the little printout. That you <laughs> that, it's just no mercy like, by the end of it. Lucky, back me up. I was sent the whole person. I kept a list. I kept the printed out email of the list of the I have to say oh, that Lord. those people with the list that went round with you checking it <laughs> off and telling everyone to sit the fuck down and eat the fruit salad they ordered, you were our favourites and you got extra pigs in blankets. <laughs> <laughs> and the worst pe- people at any catering event is when you're walking around with the food. The guy who looks up and goes, "Waiter, but like, the uh, fuck are you?" Go to the back of the list. You're at the back of the fucking queue, mate. Yeah, they get you, and you don't get the gravy. You get the fat runoff from the meat with a spoonful of leftover had... gravy. Uh, <laughs> 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 I've had people whistle at me as well. I've actually had people whistle at me when I usually when I'm behind the bar. But yeah, actually Chris... whistle. Christmas is just a terrible time. 
Yeah. It's just a terrible time at pubs anyway, because every amateur who never comes to the pub during the rest yeah. of the year is suddenly in the pub. Waits as well. So they'll have a but glass and a half of wine and they will be the equivalent of your 15 pyre at three o'clock on a They Saturday. don't know how to drink. They don't know how to order. They're going to clog up the bar for about five minutes, turning round to every individual person saying, oh, what do you want? You want, oh, and a JD and Coke. And they make the JD and Coke. And then they'll turn around to someone else. And go, oh, what do you want? Oh, I want a glass of red wine. Glass and then it'll be a Guinness at the though. end. Or order all 25 drinks at once because I'm not a moron and I'll remember them. Rather oh, I know, but you work in a bar, so clearly you are a moron <laughs> because they think that anybody who works behind a bar is a complete dick. The best, I, so we, I was at a, a managing a cocktail bar and the best one was uh, the, the people that would order, and the Cheeto, which if you, <laughs> you don't say it right, you're not having one. Um, and then they would wait for you to make it. So for those that don't know, this involves adding lots of ingredients, muddling them together, looks like a load of crushed ice in. It's like a finite process. And then going, I'll have another one of them. No, you won't. No. Yeah, oh, no, you don't order to <laughs> yeah. eat them separately. Mm, Why no. not? Because they're a rule. No. Just like, and, and you know, I did yeah. have one bartender once, but you know the little printed labels um, that you could make for behind the bar to label your stuff, like where the apple juice goes and labels mm. the cranberry juice? He printed a big long one out that said a spritzer is not a spritzer if it's made with lemonade and stuck it to the front of his till. It was brilliant. <laughs> Anyway, we've been on the air for nearly an hour and we've only discussed one moment of sporting greatness so far. Well, I think that I means think I win it. then. Fine. Okay. <laughs> Clive, you've won. Everybody, because... while we're at it, does anyone else... Be your lightweight. Zach's through? got to go to bed pretty soon. So, yeah. um... <laughs> Carry on talking. <laughs> I've got... My, I've mine's, got a big, mine's a Big Mac with large fries, please. <laughs> Zach, have you got anything you... Do you know what? The heartbreakingly, the, the defender of McDonald's, James isn't here. <laughs> He's still in the waiting room. <laughs> oh, Zach. Um... <laughs> Yeah. Well, unlike Marcus, I was actually listening to what Clive was saying. I, I just, I'm, I'm not convinced, Clive. I wanted to be convinced. I was hoping for voices as well, you know, different impressions. I, I, had, Sorry, I, I, had, I had a lot of hopes for this The trouble is when people are cycling solo, they're not talking much. No, well, perhaps that's the issue with cycling. Um, <laughs> Clive, I, I mean, you said... Of career, I talked the entire bloody time. Were Cursing you to yourself about how far. <laughs> it was a lot of swearing and a lot of mcpooing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've said that basically you watch this sport by following transponders as they move across Europe, which is basically watching radar, which I was going to do as a job for one point. So I'm not convinced that that kind of makes for an exciting sport. And the other thing he said was that this kind of proved or was an example of the fact that women were much better at men in terms of endurance and their not, accomplishments not, not and being better, able to beat. But they, were, they were the equal. Well, uh, one word, childbirth. You know, if you ever need a demonstration of why women are just better than men, could a bloke piss a tennis ball? No, he couldn't. So therefore, women having to give birth instantly means that you trump. I've been there three times. It doesn't look that bad. <laughs> you're not the one doing it this is why you're divorced Chris <laughs> I don't think it's about how it looks oh, we've all been taking sympathy on Chris but he turned around to his wife and went that looks alright <laughs> what are you complaining about hmm? she, she didn't use any painkillers <laughs> we actually do some bloody sport yeah, well, <laughs> I can't believe I'm the one saying that for fuck's sake. Yeah. Ooh, <laughs> like ooh, ooh, bloody hell. At this at this rate, we're of one an hour. We'll still be here in twelve hours time, which possibly we don't want to be. Right, okay, let's go to someone who's gonna get straight to the point. Um let's go to Kate. So I think the greatest and best things are quite a personal choice. What's great for one person isn't necessarily great for another. There are many sporting moments that were undeniably great, though they may not in your eyes be the best sporting moment ever. But the moments I'm about to describe were definitely an inspiration for me. And although I'm not quite old enough to remember all of them, they certainly shaped my life. 
And so first an honorary mention to show jumping superstar Nick Skelton, who I've adored for as long as I can remember. As a child, I would watch him riding, studying in detail. His bond with and the trust between him and his horses is the stuff of legend. He and Lastic seemed to defy gravity when they soared over seven foot seven to break the puissance record in 1978, a record that still stands today. What a great moment. I was devastated when Nick fell and broke his neck. But 16 years later, I cried again when, aged 58, he won his first individual Olympic gold in Rio. It was truly special when he climbed onto the podium to receive that medal. Nick Skelton has inspired generations and proved to us all that dreams really can come true. And when speaking of Olympic fairy tales, surely one should mention Stroller. Bought as a junior pony for a farmer's daughter, their incredible rise to international fame summed up every schoolgirl rider's dream. What pony-mad little girl hasn't dreamt of taking her pony to the Olympics? For Marion Coates, that dream came true with Stroller. The pony he leapt to victory in the Hickstead Derby, one of the most gruelling and imposing show jumping courses in the world. He's the only pony ever to have won the event and did so by jumping the only clear of 44 starters. Aaron and Stroller, like Nick and Lastic, also jumped puissance. At the Antwerp show in 67, Stroller cleared the wall at six foot eight and only touched a brick at six foot ten to win jointly with Alwyn Schokemoller on Athlet, a huge horse and puissance specialist. He's also the only pony ever to compete in Olympic show jumping. 1968, Mexico City. It was a strange year for all the equestrians at the Olympics. Many horses had a difficult time adjusting to the high altitude and the moody climate. Moreover, it was a punishing challenge, even for regular sized jumpers. The first round had 17 efforts in a vast arena to be covered in a blazing 96 seconds. Only four of the initial 87 competitors were in within the time. The second round was more like a puissance. The imposing central fence was one metre 70 high and two metres 20 wide. At 14.1, that's just over a metre 40, Stroller could have traversed under it more easily than over. But over it he went. He seemed to grow wings. And after two strenuous rounds and a jump off that pitted the pair against the legendary Bill Steinkraus and Snowbound, Marion and Stroller took home the individual silver medal with one of only two clear rounds. What a great moment. An inspiration not only for pony mad girls, they show people from all walks of life that you can never set your sights too high. On that note, I would like to introduce Bob Champion and Aldeniti. Their fight back from injury and illness to victory is the stuff of legend. They overcame all the odds when they galloped into the hearts of the nation. At only 15, Bob Champion won his first horse race. After his initial taste of victory, he continued to race on the National Hunt Circuit. His skill in the saddle won him plenty of races. He tried his luck racing in America and enjoyed success, though his career really took off back in Britain, and he had dreams of winning the Grand National. Aldenita was a chestnut gelding who ran and won his first race, ridden by champion, in 1975. A further five respectable runs before disaster struck, he pulled up lame after a race and needed more than a year off. Fully recovered, he raced six times towards the end of the following season. He was placed in all and won twice. Bob Champion boldly predicted that one day Aldeniti would win the Grand National. The 77-78 season started well with a win, but by November, disaster struck again. Aldeniti chipped two bones in his leg. After seven months box rest, the equivalent, the equine equivalent of bed rest, and six months careful rehabilitation, he was back to racing on Boxing Day 1978 in the three-mile King George VI chase at Kempton. Another successful but not remarkable season. Seven races, two wins, a third in the Gold Cup and a second in the Scottish National. By this time, Aldeniti had run 22 races, all of them ridden by Bob Champion, who was at the height of his career. That was about to change. His career and his life was about to take a major detour. In 1979, Bob Champion was diagnosed with testicular cancer. Doctors gave him six, maybe eight months to live. Things looked grim. But an orchidectomy, the rather beautifully named but horrific procedure of removing his testicles, together with an extremely aggressive programme of chemotherapy, if begun immediately, offered him around a 40% chance of survival. The odds really were stacked against him. Meanwhile, Aldeniti was fighting his own battle. He sustained a serious leg injury at Sandown in his first race without Bob. This time he'd torn a tendon. The horse had broken down twice. He'd be lucky to ever be sound again, let alone race. Vets said he should be put to sleep. Josh Gifford, his trainer, and Nick Embiricos, the owner, said no. 
whatever happens, you have to keep this horse alive. It was the only thing Bob had to cling to. They said it might be the only thing keeping him alive, that he might one day win the national. That was the whole point of keeping Aldeniti alive. It was something for Bob to aim at. They didn't really think Aldeniti would race again. It was because that was what Bob was dreaming about. You need a goal if you're critically ill. You have to have something to live for. Bob Champion was discharged from hospital in January 1980. The illness and chemotherapy had left him emaciated and so weak he could hardly stand. Treatment had not been easy and a large-scale infection nearly claimed his life. Ardeniti spent the whole of 1980 recovering at his owner's farm. By December, he was doing so well that Nick asked Josh Gifford to have him back for training, adding, we're going to have a crack at the national, the Grand National, the most valuable jump race in Europe the longest national hunt race by some way at four miles, two and a half furlongs, and home to some of the biggest and most famous fences. Valentine's Brook, a solid five-foot hedge with a five-foot six wide brook on the landing side. Beecher's Brook, similar dimensions, but an additional drop of nearly a foot on the landing side. Canal Turn, an imposing five-foot hedge with a 90-degree turn immediately on landing. The chair, five-foot two with a six-foot wide ditch in front of it. Almost every fence is a solid five foot plus square and many have five or six foot wide ditches on one or other side. These are jumped at a flat out gallop, often over 30 miles an hour. It is considered the toughest, most challenging race in the world. Incredibly, both horse and rider got back to full fitness and their day of destiny arrived, April the 4th, 1981. Champions cancer and Aldeniti's injuries caused many to speculate the team would be lucky to get round the course, never mind win. His decent form meant the gelding was assigned one of the heavier handicap weights, 10 stone 13. Having captured the public's heart, they started at 10 to 1 second favourite behind Spartan Missile. Aldeniti took the lead at the 11th fence of 30 and maintained his advantage for the rest of the race, fighting off a late challenge from Spartan Missile on the run-in to win by four lengths. Watched by 60,000 people at Aintree and 750 million on TV worldwide, the miracle had happened. Bob Champion had beat cancer and his horse, twice near fatally injured, had galloped all of his rivals into submission. Ardeniti retired to his owner's farm in Sussex not long after the win, but he kept busy, starring as himself in Champions, the film of their story, and raising funds for the Bob Champion Cancer Trust. He made a return to Aintree on Grand National Day in 1987 when he was accorded a hero's welcome at the end of a 250-mile fundraising walk from Buckingham Palace. In return for a minimum £1,000 donation, anyone could ride Aldeniti for a mile. They raised nearly a million quid that day. Bob raced successfully for a few more years before turning his hand to training and setting up his trust, which has raised millions. He continues to raise funds for cancer research, now aged 72. Their victory is one of the most memorable and emotional moments ever to be recorded. They are both legends of the horse racing world. Their legacy is a sense of hope for all those who follow in their paths. They taught us that even when things look desperate, success is just over the next fence for those who choose to make the jump. Wow. I just, do you know what? As, as like inspiring as that got towards the second end, I fear that as soon as you uttered the words, removed the testicles, both of the male judges (laughs) went to shit and heard nothing else. (laughs) Yeah, I, I'm still on the testicle thing. <laughs> this is a contender. I don't really care what Marcus says. He can throw his tiara across the room. This is just one of the great sporting stories about how the two of them kind of got each other through the most horrendous um, period of their lives. I, I haven't got any questions. I'm, I'm with Kate a lot of the way. It's going to take some beating. Thank you. This is sounding more and more like um, a Disney, isn't it? You know, the, the prince and his horse, they're, they're getting through it together. But, I, yeah, I was massive. Marcus, you're a posh boy. You like horses and riding and polo and shit like that. No, I, <laughs> I go out with a girl who likes that kind of thing. And you just have to kind of smile politely because, you know, the glass of uh, pims at the end of it. Um, <laughs> no stereotypes, no stereotypes at all. Yeah, I quite like horses. Uh, Grand National is good. I think Kit summarised some of it quite nicely, which was the horse was kept alive for some other twat's dream. Um which kind of is how it feels. I mean, there's a lot of controversy with the Grand National and, you know, the amount of horses that are killed because of horse racing. So, yeah, maybe it doesn't quite set so well with my vegetarianism, but I, I you know, would put a five on the GGs every now and again. So, well, I'll just not eat the horse, Marcus. Do you not? 
I thought that's what you did at the Hunt Ball. That's the oh, French. You're getting confused, mate. <laughs> well, unless you unless you're one of these idiots that buys eight burgers for thirty p in Asda and then complains oh, that. No, it's like Tesco lasagna is. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> it's alright, everyone just ignores uh, Zach's little bit of xenophobia in the middle um, yeah no, it's, quite, it's, quite, it's quite nice to have something that's horse related because I'm expecting there to be a lot of football stuff later so yeah thank you brilliant, okay, I'm going to go next but, but I have done any prep because um, I, I couldn't be asked, frankly <laughs> so I've been out driving people's prescriptions around and I was pondering um, and I decided, uh, first of all, like what Kate said about how certain moments are mean a lot to you, but possibly not to any other people. I at least know I have backing in this room from Holmes and uh, O'Connell when I say that that Eden Hazard shot from the outside of his foot at Stamford Bridge that completely destroyed Tottenham's title hope for every fucking special, as was the moment that he then knee slid or celebrated past them um, after having said in the pre-match interview that because we'd had such a rubbish season and had barely got in the top half of the table that uh, basically all he was living for was destroying their hopes and dreams, which he then did with the outside of his foot. Or do you go for Steven Gerrard falling on his ass and Denver Bar just galloping away? The guy that lived literally tripped over his own feet anytime anyone passing the ball poor Denver Bar goes lolloping away and that was the perfect word for it lolloping towards the goal uh, and destroys Liverpool's hopes and dreams after Steven Gerrard has pulled everybody into a huddle and said this doesn't fucking slip before kickoff he then slipped right over and it makes the most awesome gif ever but I didn't go for either of those I went for the Jamaican bobsled team and I didn't go for the actual Jamaican bobsled team. Because in my head, that film is a documentary. I don't care what anybody says in my head. Those four guys in the film are the guys from the bobsled. And that is how it happened. And those are the faces. And anybody now who wants to come in and sing the Jamaican bobsled team song gets big brownie points off of that. Anyone I think can... Clive can do accents. So I think uh, slightly <laughs> racist Rastafarian is the way we're going with this. <laughs> How does it go again? What do you like? Some people they don't believe Jamaica. They have a bobsled team. Come on. I've never seen Some it. People say they know they can't believe. That's it. Jamaica, Jamaica we have a bobsled bobsled team. team. Yes, it's brilliant. Uh, hey, I'm sorry, but anyone. And uh, what's with the egg? The whole thing about having the lucky egg down his pants for the entire thing. I don't care. I I am much much older now, and I'm telling you now. Every time I watch that film and they crash. And his dad's there with a Jamaica t-shirt on and they're all applauding as they walk the fucking dopey-ass bobsled over the line makes me weep. And anyone that thinks that isn't the greatest sporting moment of all time can suck it. Any questions? I'm Canadian from Calgary, growing up in Canada when that happened. And the only thing that matters in the Winter Olympics is the ice hockey. But that year, every Canadian suddenly became Jamaican. Which yeah. is weird because it's a very white country, but you know, it, it, the whole place just went nuts for them. And you know, it, if if everyone could have voted and just given them the gold medal and sent the Swiss home or whoever it was, um, some some somebody German, they would have because the whole place just went the nuts. Eyes driving. I think they were Swiss, weren't they? The meanies. Yeah. They well, were, the, you, no, the baddies, uh, the baddies the have to German, be German, doesn't it? Uh, okay. The East German bastard was the uh, really nasty one. Yeah. Um, and and Doris uh, aspired to be like the Swiss. Yes, I, I have, I've watched this a few times, and uh, in fact, dressed as one of the uh, four um, our 2012 rugby tour to Cologne um, with three others who also donned um, lycra and yellow skid lids, and we got a little yellow toboggan and stuck a Jamaican flag on it and carried it around Cologne as we went out on the piss. For this reason, my ambition in life, my travel bucket list thing, I think it's Latvia is the only place you can go where you can bobsled as a tourist. And there are there are you three guys that do the driving and whatever, and you're basically the useless person sitting three back or whatever, and you get to do a run. You also, you can do the ridiculous fucking thing where you just lie on a, a wooden frame and lob yourself down a mountain you can do that as well but they it's called the frog because they frame you entirely in green crash mats so that you don't kill yourself and push you down that way but yeah uh, that jamaican bobsled team for me they are my heroes and yeah i still cry like a sissy bitch every time i see that last scene so this greatest sporting moment involves 
a lucky egg down someone's pants. That's our yep. euphemism. And sliding around on ice, which is notorious for being incredibly slippery at the best of times and sliding down the hill. Yeah. You're not selling this to me, Alex. Dudes, this is like, you should love this. You two are the quintessential little last picks for every team whiners that don't like sport who i mean let's just get it out of the way you weren't good at any sport therefore you don't like any sport and you complain about sport and you don't yes. want to but zach i'm looking at you marcus i'm looking at you as well because i suspect that even though you are built like a brick shit house you sucked at sport and that this is why where your bitterness comes from these guys sucked at this sport they lived on a fucking Caribbean island and they decided to be bobsledders. If you haven't seen the film, the bit where they first try and run on ice is brilliant. They were you in Lycra in a bobsled with an egg stuffed down their pants. And yet Alex, nobody like, wants to see me in Lycra. This is why I'm not a cyclist. I kind of do now with an egg stuffed down your pants. I'm, I'm twigging something here. Can we do made up sports events? <laughs> <laughs> because if so, I'm completely changing mine. <laughs> Well, that's that's one of the problems with this, that you haven't chosen the Jamaican bobsled team. You've chosen Cool Runnings, no, I which, has just I've been, chosen which has just been every rugby boy's excuse to black up no. for the last 20 years. I have <laughs> picked the Jamaican up, bobsled team's up. appearance at the 1988 Olympia Winter Olympics is what I've picked. Well, I can sympathise slightly because in a stereotypical way, yes, I've done the Sam Ritz Cresta run. When I was at university, because yeah, I was I was one of those. But that obviously, that's a massive stereotypical experience for all university students. We did that at Bournemouth all the time, to be honest. <laughs> well, Bournemouth was at university. Um, it's a, it was a, it was a polytech, so you kind of. Um, but the one of the biggest things you just absolutely turned me off with the opening because what there was something about someone's left foot curving through the air and i was like lost where the foot was going and uh, just following on from marcus when you were talking about football shout out marcus you've had your chance <laughs> when you were talking about football all i wrote down was just something football not gonna win um so i'm glad that you went for something different but i'm i'm not convinced by this i'm sorry it's because you have no fucking soul why would I want something that emulates my own shit sporting experience? Because then you don't have to be quite so embarrassed about being so bitter about sport. Cause I'm not embarrassed. I'm just naturally <laughs> bitter. <laughs> right. OK, let's move on. Let's go to... Do you know who I'm going to go to next? Because I know that I think John's supposed to be working, but he's so happy to hear this one. Charlie. Yay. OK, I'm really looking forward to this one. Um I was dreading this because I'm I'm not a sports fanatic. The only sports I actually follow with any enthusiasm are the boat races, come on Cambridge, University Challenge, come on Cambridge, and RuPaul's Drag Race. And I assure you, if there's a Cambridge queen in there, I will be cheering her on. But that being said, I am inordinately fond of watching big men hit each other. Heavyweight boxing. I've always enjoyed it. And I'm always happy to watch a Rocky movie at any time, though he was never really more than a middleweight, really. The Rumble in the Jungle is what I want to talk to you about today. It was scheduled to take place in Kinshasa, Zaire in September 1974. Legendary boxing promoter Don King had promised the former heavyweight champion Muhammad Ali and the current title holder George Foreman $5 million apiece to fight now 70s that's even more money than it is now both fighters had agreed and king went off to find someone willing to front 10 million dollars to host his fight he found his guy in the dictatorial president mabuto of zaire who saw the fight as an opportunity to promote both his country and himself around the world the fight very quickly ballooned into a huge exhibition bout and to Ali, from the get-go, exuded confidence from every poor. He said, if you think the world was surprised when Nixon resigned, wait till I kick Foreman's behind. Um, I love everything that came out of that man's mouth. He was fabulous. But the general consensus at that time was that Ali was about to have his ass handed to him by Foreman. You see, Ali had recently struggled against Joe Frazier, who Foreman had beaten and knocked down seven times in their recent fight. Foreman was the younger fighter and the reigning heavyweight champion, and the odds had Ali at four to one, and even that was pretty generous. 
Ali had been stripped of his titles when he refused the Vietnam draft back, to, back in 1967. And in, in addition to the $10,000 fine he'd received and suspended jail sentence, he was banned from competing in the ring for three years. His big comeback fight had been against Joe Frazier, who beat him by judge's decision. There was at this time only one other fighter who'd beaten Ali, that was Ken Norton, who Foreman had put down in two rounds. So you can see why the 25-year-old reigning champion Foreman was not expected to struggle in any way against the 32-year-old former champ Ali. But none of this damp dampened Ali's spirit. He must have been scared, though, because he was far from stupid. He would have known he was the underdog, but confronted it with all the characteristic confidence and humour in fast-paced rhymes. He was articulate. He was quick-witted whenever he appeared on camera pre-fight, though it was said that he never looked at Foreman's heavy bag with a fist dent in it the size of a melon whenever he had to walk past it into training. Ali said that he would dance. But then everything got delayed when Foreman sustained a cut to the eyebrow in sparring. The fight was put back by six weeks to allow him to heal. This rattled Ali, who'd been surviving on a strict diet of optimism and bravado. By the, day of the, by the time the fight rolled around on the 30th of October 1974, even Ali thought he was going out to be beaten. His dressing room was thick with the atmosphere of consensus that they're basically sending their guy out to be pummeled. To break the tension, Ali said that he would dance, repeatedly, and then he danced, and got everyone in the room dancing with him. Foreman waiting in his dressing room was ready for Ali's dance. He'd trained for it. The guy had been saying he was going to dance over and over again. Foreman was ready to cut off the ring, making his opponent unable to do his dance when pinned to the ropes. Everything about staging of this fight had a sinister tension to it. Firstly, the fight was scheduled for 4am to work with US television timings. And secondly, Mobuto had built the open air stadium over what may or may not have been enough prison cells to hold a thousand known criminals rounded up before the foreign press came to town. There were even rumours that Mobuto had had a hundred of these rounded up criminals shot as an example to those he hadn't imprisoned. Some journalists even reported that the ground of the stadium was bloodied. The air was heavy with rain. The six-week delay had pushed the fight back precariously close to the monsoon season, and it was into a ring surrounded by tens of thousands of spectators that Ali and Foreman finally met. As the bell sounds for round one, all begins as expected. Ali dances around the ring, landing a few good punches to Foreman's chin and cheek. Then Ali does something so audacious that it shocks those boxing aficionados who saw it. He throws a right hand lead. Now that's a punch thrown with the right hand that goes fully across the body with no second shot ready in the left hand, so no real defensive stance. An experienced boxer should be able to see a punch like that coming from a mile away. So to throw it says, I think you are slow and stupid. Ali throws 12 right hand leads in the opening round and Foreman takes the insult. Foreman pins Ali to the ropes and starts hitting him with a barrage of punishing shots to the body. By the time the bell rings, Ali goes to his corner, realising that Foreman is stronger than him and not afraid of him. He knows he's got a struggle ahead of him and it's a real oh shit moment. So Ali does what Ali does best. He turns to the crowd, raises his fists and cries, Ali, Bumbaye! And the thousands of people in the audience return the chant. Ali, Bumbaye, which means Ali, kill him. Recharged, Ali goes into the second round with a tactic so bizarre that journalists suspect the fight has been fixed. He goes to the ropes, allowing Foreman to hit him repeatedly, more and more punishment to the body, as Ali physically leans back onto the ropes, his head so far back that it's out of the ring. Ali takes round after round of this same treatment from Foreman. He's being pummeled. It's not nice to watch. But as you look closer, you see that Ali's lips are moving. He's talking to Foreman. He's egging him on. You don't hit as hard as I thought you would. You're not hitting hard enough, George. Is that all you've got? This tactic is called the Roper Dope. By the middle of the fifth, Foreman's starting to look tired. 
It's exhausting hitting this guy with everything and getting nowhere. Ali's slipping more inside shots into Foreman's head with each round. Each round he lands a few more shots until in the eighth, Ali lands another right hand lead from the ropes, which lands with such precision you can see the sweat fly from Foreman's head. More blows follow from Ali, deadly and accurate to Foreman's head, until he begins to stagger exhausted towards him, his tired fists flailing, lurching forward like a mummy. But blink and you'll miss it as Ali delivers a combination of blows to Foreman's body, inside shots to the head, and starts him spinning around Ali in a daze. As he sees Foreman go down, Ali stands with his right hand cocked for its next punch, holding back and watching as he falls to the mat. Foreman receives the count, and the fight is ended on the count of eight, his first loss in 40 professional fights. Ali is named heavyweight champion of the world against all odds and using a level of tactical genius that no one had seen coming for him. After the fight, the rains came. Now, I believe that the Rumble in the Jungle is the greatest boxing match ever contested and definitely a contender for the greatest sporting moment ever. It still feels inconceivable that Ali could have won, watching it back nearly 50 years later. The story of our two fighters ends in genuine friendship, but it didn't come overnight and Foreman suffered a deep depression after the fight. But it was Foreman who helped Ali onto the stage to accept their Oscar for the Rumble in the Jungle documentary, When We Were Kings, in 1996. I love that. Wow. Um, I love that Kit is exhausted because he basically just reenacted all eight rounds while you were talking. He managed <laughs> to keep a straight face. I like the slow motion go down at the end. Uh, but I think Marcus is giving you bonus points for sound effects. Yes! I did a clap. Yeah. Hugely. Um, I'm not a huge fan of boxing because it is just quite violent, but it was brilliantly told. And I, I haven't seen the footage of Rumble in the Jungle myself. Uh, and I felt like I could kind of envision it and why it, why it mattered. Uh, sound effects, uh, hugely. You know, we, all, we were all very impressed with Clive's voices. And uh, I think just a simple bell got us there. So, uh, Charlie, you could have been a contender. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Zach? I think it's a little bit ironic that Marcus is uh, complaining about violence when he's in the TA, but then I suppose he's in the TA, so perhaps that's... It's not the it. weekend, so I'm, I don't care. Yeah, the only thing I have about boxing is that it's it's smashing someone's head in, and with the best one in the world, you can watch that in certain parts of Southampton for free. <laughs> nice. So... Is it's, it really that it is special? one of those. It is one of those things. I mean, look, you could you can watch a bunch of kids have a kick around in a field, and that's not the same as watching Premiership football. It's you've it obviously is... not seen Burnley recently. <laughs> hey, <laughs> I'm a Villa fan, so you know, <laughs> um, I'm not used to watching good football. Um, but no, when you see when you see re- boxing done really well. You, and this is an example of it. I mean, I've been down the York Hall and I've seen sluggers just hitting each other. And it's not nice. It's not nice to watch when it when it's too evenly matched and it's not really a competition. But when you see something like this and you can see that there's tactics and that Ali deliberately held back that he was going to throw right hand leads because no one throws right hand leads. Foreman hadn't trained for that. No one would dare do that to him in a sparring ring. My God, you get your you'd be on the map before you could say hi. <laughs> so in your defence, Bertie was listening to that, like staring at the screen. Oh, Bertie's my friend. Yeah, you woke up and listened. That's because he thinks the bell means dreamies. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what you have to say word? Oh. Dreamies. <laughs> Shut up, because there is actually, because it was Christmas and I felt guilty about continually chugging junk food. Um, in front of him, I did let him have a bag of dreamies, and there's still a few there. He's looking at me like, now you tell me. Oh, look. <laughs> I really like that one. John, you waited around to hear that. You impressed? Yeah, I, I was. I mean, the rope-a-dope was a good example of using strategy. It's it's kind of like when uh, you go out and you watch, uh, you know, racing, uh, NASCAR racing. It, it appears to be three hours of left turns, and there's more <laughs> to it than that. Boxing even more so because you you really do have to tailor your strategy to the other person. Um, 
Ali, uh, Ali was famous for being agile, but he didn't use that agility to run around the ring. He basically stood there and then took the punches and let the ropes take a lot of the punch until, uh, until as uh, uh, slugger and, and brawler style fighters do, uh, they get worn out. They, they're the ones who want to put you down in the first couple of rounds because they can't go the distance. And this one was a good example of, uh, of, of strategy. And, and we, see, uh, we see that kind of you know, tactical acumen down the road with Mike Tyson, who is a famous switch hitter. And then down to, uh, I mean, today Tyson Fury is, is the, the guy for tactics. So I, it, was, it was wonderful. And, and I think there were like, I thought I read there were a billion people who watched that. And I vaguely remember it from my childhood. So it stood out. At the time, it was the biggest television audience for anything ever. They showed it around the world. Um, it, was, it was a huge deal. And that's aside from, you, you know, all the, the things you can talk about in terms of um, the black civil rights movement at that time and where that was and the significance of it being fought in Africa. And you know, there's just so much there. It's such a, I mean, watch when we were kings if if you haven't seen it guys because it's it's such a there's not i can't fit it all in but it was it's so so important and so wonderful to watch um no i really like that one although i think it's just forever ruined it for me now that i will just associate rope and ali with burnley because that's exactly what burnley do but anyway <laughs> marcus is like what's the burnley uh right let's move on to I'm going to go to Beth because she looks like she might fall asleep. Um, sadly for you, Beth, John was going to cheer you up and do some Quidditch shit, but he can't be bothered, so he's not now. So why don't you talk? <laughs> I'll talk and I'll do the. I'll be the first one to step up and take the bait of the fact that our judges hate football. Um, I'll, I'll step up to that first because I have done something that you know Kate pointed out as well you know what might be great to some people is not great to others and this one's great to me so I don't care what the rest of you think basically I'm with you um, they slag off football will beat them up yeah and um, do they who would win in a match me and you versus Zach and Marcus come on we know how that would go <laughs> <laughs> have you got cake in this fight or not <laughs> don't need cake <laughs> okay so it was Christmas 2004 and Chelsea were well on the way to winning the 2004-05 Premier League season. Middlesbrough and Everton were both in the top five. Manchester City were just an average team at the time. And West Bromwich Albion were rock bottom of the Premier League with just 10 points. It was a team that looked doomed to be relegated the following May. They only had one win and seven draws after 19 matches. And the teams above them had started to pull away. But what happened over the next few months will stay in the memories of Baggies fans forever and must surely be one of the greatest sporting moments of all time. In all fairness to West Brom, despite the terrible start to the season, they didn't have actually have that bad a squad. They were definitely short in areas, but with Carnew and Earnshaw up front, the least you'd have expected is a few goals between them. The Baggies were struggling, though, to get goals and to get points on the board. Gary Megson was in his fifth season at the Hawthorns, having taken them up twice from the championship and survived one relegation already. It wasn't a great start to the season and the, and the board had seen the signs early on. Megson was relieved of his duties after a 3-0 thrashing from Crystal Palace at the end of October. Brian Robson was hired to get West Brom's back season back on track and he began his reign in November. But a poor start took them through a long, hard winter with heavy defeats along the way. They sat bottom of the table on Christmas Day. No team had survived relegation after sitting bottom of the league on this date since its rebranding in 1992. So not surprisingly, they were being written off by all the pundits, with many expecting them to be relegated by the start of April. It was two months before Robson's first win, and with that under his belt, he was determined to keep West Brom up. Standing five points from safety and some way behind on goal difference, he knew it was a difficult but not impossible task. The January transfer window saw the addition of Kieran Richardson on loan from Manchester United, as well as purchases of Robert Richard Chaplow and Kevin Campbell from Burnley and Everton, respectively. 
Over the course of the next few months, it was clear that a monumental task lay ahead of the Baggies. Vital games against relegation rivals were not capitalised upon, and the points were not mounting up in the way that was needed. However, things started to change for the club. An important win in March against local rivals Birmingham City gave a glimmer of hope, but a stellar performance, possibly their best of the season, against Charlton Athletic resulted in the club's only away win of the season and the hope that a change might be coming. With one game left to go of the season, Norwich were on 33 points, Southampton and Crystal Palace were on 32 points, and West Brom were on 31 points. Of the four, three would go down, but which three? The final day of the season, the 5th of May 2005, Sue came around. It was a sunny spring day across the country and has since been labelled as Survival Saturday. The league title had already been decided with Chelsea leading by 11 points, so all eyes were on the bottom four. West Brom were the only team that statistically needed to win due to Norwich's goal difference. Palace or Southampton could rely on a draw as long as the other results went their way. Ten minutes in, Southampton were ahead in their game against Man United, but it wasn't long until Man U equalised, while Norwich went 1-0 down. In the space of 60 seconds, two goals had changed the whole atmosphere. Half an hour in and Palace were also 1-0 down. West Brom were sitting patiently waiting for their moment. Norwich were down 2-0 against Fulham. Half-time came around and the teams only had 45 minutes to change the outcome. As it stood at that time, Southampton would be the survivor. The second half kicked off with Southampton 45 minutes from safety but they knew one goal in any game could change that. The first goal in the second half for Norwich, now down to three, now 3-0 three down to Fulham. Completely out of Norwich's hands now, they needed all the other results to go their way. But only minutes later at the Hawthorns, for the Baggies, Jeff Horsfield scored, putting them 1-0 up and out of the relegation zone. At the same time, Palace pushed back and got an equaliser. It really was going down to the wire. Time was running out. Just after the hour mark, Manchester United went 2-1 up against Southampton, essentially confirming their relegation. It was down to West Brom and Crystal Palace, and goals were coming left, right and centre. Palace went up 2-1, moving them out of relegation and putting West Brom back in. Two minutes later, Fulham put a fourth past Norwich, and at the Hawthorns, West Brom were 2-0 up. The crowd at the Hawthorns were anxiously celebrating knowing that the score down at the Valley meant it wouldn't be enough. They would need Charlton to equalise to send down the rent. <clears throat> they would need Charlton to equalise to help send down Crystal Palace. With only 10 minutes remaining, Norwich and Southampton fans had accepted their fate. West Brom held on to their 2-0 two wi win and looked strong at the back, stopping Portsmouth at every moment. When Charlton equalised in the 82nd minute, Pan Palace knew without a late goal, that they would be joining Southampton and Norwich. The, filter, the news started to filter around the Hawthorns and the Baggies fans were on their feet, nervously celebrating with a nail-biting end of the game to come. The final whistle blew at the Hawthorns. Fans around the ground had start, already been on their mobiles, getting updates as they were happening across the country. Everyone, including the Portsmouth fans, stood waiting for the news to come through. The players were waiting pitch side as Brian Robson and sections of the crowd finally got the news they were after. The final whistle had gone in all the other three games. Norwich were beaten, Man U had beaten Southampton and Crystal Palace couldn't find the win they were after. West Bromwich Albion had done it. The first team in Premier League history to be bottom at Christmas and survive relegation. The crowd invaded the pitch to celebrate with the players even including the Portsmouth fans who joined in knowing that they had helped to relegate bitter rivals Southampton. Brian Robson and his men could finally breathe a sigh of relief after completing the Great Escape. Only two teams have completed this feat in the Premier League since then. Sunderland in 2013-14, while Leicester completed it in 14 and 15 and then went on to win the league the following season. The Great Escape will really be, throughout Premier League history, for its incredible feat and will always be remembered by Baggies fans everywhere, including myself, who remembers watching this being the ripe old age of 11. This feat can bring hope, hope to any club 
that even though there might be bottom at Christmas, they can still make it. It brings hope because this is football and in the greatest league in the world, anything is possible. I think Matt was on your side till you revealed how old you were in 2004 and now he hates you. <laughs> <laughs> Where did Fulham finish that year, Matt? It was 16th. It wasn't much higher. But I think if we didn't beat Norwich, we would have been in the same thing. I think I was at that game, actually. But it was last game of the season, which would have meant we'd been in the pub all afternoon. So I don't think I actually have any. Yeah, I think I it ended remember it. ended six nil to Fulham. Mm. I think in the end. Yeah, Jim, Brian McBride went nuts, and I think he got three or four something silly. Like yeah. That. Mm. Uh, playing devil's advocate, Beth. How many times have the baggies been relegated since then? Uh, since then, three times I think, because they got relegated the season after, went back up, and then stayed up from two thousand and nine until two thousand and eighteen. And we all know what's happened in the last few years for the baggies. More importantly, how many times have Villa? How much time have Villa spent in the Championship? I think they only got relegated once, but they stayed down a long time, didn't they? Yeah, Probably. I've got a sound effect for that too. Yeah. The only thing I have which can make yeah. a sound effect is 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 this. I don't. Right, is, is it, can we find a use for... Is that a Webley? <laughs> yeah. I think only if you load it so Marcus can shoot himself listening to this. <laughs> uh, I'm, oh. I'm with you, Beth. I'm with you. It's, the, it, it's a fantastic... If you just go back and watch the footage of in the stadium of the fans watching and waiting for the news to come from the other three games and then the players absolutely erupt when the news comes through and yeah. the crowd, like... My uncle and my cousin were at the game, and then separately in a different part of the stadium, my husband and father-in-law were in the stadium as well. And they said the atmosphere was the, is the best. They all say it was the best game that they've ever been to, purely because of that last twenty minutes where they, the it just went absolutely mad. And like seriously, this uh, is what football can do for you. You yeah. peasants sitting there slating it. I think Clive and Holmes probably. Well, I don't know because Holmes, you weren't there, but Munich for a Chelsea fan is the same. But, the second... but you, Alex, you're right. I mean, I remember that whole run from the quarterfinals onwards. Yeah. With horrible, nervy bollocks, and then we were. We were supposed to be out there. against Napoli. Yeah. We were losing. We and then the only time Barcelona, that... and then obviously Torres's goal, which is Ramirez's goal, really, but Torres's goal, and yeah, knowing that Drogba was on the fifth penalty and that the man's ego was not going to withstand him not scoring it, that was the only time in my life I've seen someone walk up for a penalty for my team and being English, not shat myself because there yeah, was yeah, no way was... Drogba but... wasn't going to score that penalty. But that was the only time in about you know six or seven games where you actually thought we're, we're going to win this, you know, for <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. opposite. There, there, there have been in three times where I was sure that was it. When they scored their goal, I thought, that's it, we're finished now. Then when they got the penalty awarded to them, I was sure it was over. Again as well, repeating. Yeah. Most Are we and talk, when, talking when, about when, the same football match here? Or no. But we're a talking different about one. what football can do for people. I was not really that interested in football. And that, se- that whole season and the, that last game completely changed my my outlook on 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 football as as a sport but how much of you what you're saying is even to do with the football this is what people who don't do football don't get it's not just about the 90 minutes on the pitch it's about your friends it's about sharing the experience it's about the social yeah absolutely We've all been robbed of for the last year I, now i i went to one of the two games that we were able to go to at stanford bridge and i have to say that watching a football game without any friends around you, without anyone close to you, with zero atmosphere and everything. It wasn't proper football no. at all. You realise no. how much you missed. The, the ritual of going there, meeting up with people before the game, all the rest of it, the build-up to it, it's... Mm. Yeah, it's the whole it's, it's the whole thing. You go and like you say, Clive, like you can sit and watch like the World Cup or the Euros on your TV and it's like, oh, OK. Well, unless you're actually there, you don't get the full... Like, yeah. as you say, the atmosphere, it's going and seeing someone, grabbing a drink and, you know, grabbing one of the pies from the stand, which there is, according I think, to... a vast, vast difference between being a football fan and being a football supporter. See, I, I get the atmosphere. I, I, I do get the atmosphere. But what I don't get is that you're, you were talking about the foot flying and all of that, like, oh, the footwork's beautiful. And I just... Also, what's a baggy? 
That's their nickname. The can nickname. You, can you, Mark, well, that wasn't explained. I needed a glossary. What's the Hawthorns? Who plays there? <laughs> Look, there was a huge uh, level of assumption that we just we weren't this, there. This is not Such assumption. So ignorant. You can't look but, down at your foot and realise that hitting a ball from 20 yards out and getting it to curl into the back of the net past a world-class keeper in front of all of that keeper's biggest fans and then running past them basically with your fingers up and destroying their hopes and dreams isn't a moment of sporting excellence for the people involved, then you just have no soul. Also, I, I look forward to Marcus giving giving us all full background every time he does a slight yeah. tedious peninsula war thing in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> Yeah, we need to know all the dates and references yeah. now, please, Marcus. I'm Welcome happy to back. give you a full rundown if you wish. Matt, you're a football fan, aren't you? You're a Fulham fan. Oh, oh I'm I'm a Fulham fan. I don't know if that makes me a football fan. <laughs> um, it's not. It's not about winning, even, is it? No, it, it to, 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 to to be honest, I I I remember. I vaguely remember that game, but I remember, you know, the 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 Europe, Europa League run and being at the the game against Hamburg. Thursday night at the cottage under the lights, sat next to an old couple who had been to the 1975 FA Cup final, the only other time Fulham had been to a final. And the old dear turned to me and went, Don't worry, love, we won't, you can have our tickets to the final because we won't be alive to get there, but we'd like to see it happen. And we won. Um, and they both died the next day. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, that's not that's it's not like... true. But when I did hand her my hip flask after we scored the second goal, she drained it. So fair play to her. Yeah, I mean, but Leicester fans, it will be their title. Right? That was a great twist, though, <laughs> for a moment. Yeah, it doesn't matter if your team doesn't end up winning the biggest trophy there is. You will have no. those moments as a football fan. For Beth, it's escaping relegation. For Matt, it's one cup run. For Leicester, it's winning the title at 5,000 to one. I think the thing with football is that anything can happen. And this is why everybody is so now pissed off with the advent of VAR and stuff, because it's just, it's basically not fixed. It's not made football perfect, which... Mm-hmm. And getting to a whole other side thing, well, I actually went to Stockley Park when they tried to sell this to different groups of fans and it was always a clusterfuck and they never knew what was going to happen and everything they said was going to happen hasn't happened when they've implemented it. But it's not made football perfect and it's not got rid of error, but it's taken away your ability to celebrate a goal the instance it's scored. It's taken away part of the spontaneity and the atmosphere for you. Zach, are you at all moved by any of this? No, I've been sitting here kind of, increasingly desperately trying to interject and, and piss on all of your dreams um for me uh, beth good delivery i mean you tried to build up the suspense um there was a mention about a long and hard winter that had kind of echoes of of last week's podcast but for me football is just blokes who have paid an absurd amount of money kicking the ball pretty much everywhere except in the net and then when another player so much as looks at them funny they fall over pretending that their legs broken and claiming a foul off of a guy who was 15 feet away from them at closest. Uh, this particular one, I mean, it sounded to me like the most exciting thing was actually what was happening off the pitch rather than on the pitch, which kind of goes to prove Clive's point that if you actually watch a game of football in itself, it's not particularly exciting because not a huge amount happens. And this whole thing basically seemed to be a competition of who could avoid being branded the least crap out of the people within that division, which doesn't kind of clarify as a great sporting moment so much as a who was the least shit sporting moment. Yeah, but when you're a bad no, but the whole point is the whole point is at Christmas they had been completely written off by everyone, everywhere. All the pundits said these are the West Brom out of everyone. West Brom will go down. I mean, you were awful, and they didn't. Fair, and we were so bad that season. We were so bad. And it was called Survival Saturday, and no one died. It's Survival just... Sunday, final game of the season is always on a Sunday, Marcus. Please get with it. Yeah, but I don't even know how many minutes are in a half of football. I get very confused because it's not the same as rugby. But 45. <laughs> See, the thing well, is, even I know is that. That there is someone in this room can, that can testify to the fact that anybody that thinks that football is about supporting the best team and your team always winning, Chris is a fucking Gillingham fan. <laughs> oh, is it, Chris? Yeah, no, we're 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 rubbish. I mean, um, and, uh, the Gillingham fans I know uh, are filled with wistful melancholy. 
Yeah, I mean, you genuinely pick your team is passed down to you by someone that you love or introduced to you by someone that takes you and shares that shared experience with you. It's really, I mean, yes, there are millions of people um, who drive most normal football fans up the wall on Twitter normally uh, who just watch football on TV from many thousands of miles away. And that's okay too, because without them, it wouldn't be such a big business. But it's a very different experience to the people that actually go to games and are part of a massive community in their little club as well. It just it, and, it, and one, one of the important things about going to games is you don't have to listen to commentators and pundits. It's true. Yeah. And one of the most poisonous things in football is the crap that those people come out with. And they infect people's minds and views about football. John's and like so much so that when you up. have discussions yeah. about football with people who only watch it on television, their views are totally distorted. Well, by they all ignorant. appear to think that Steve McManaman knows what he's talking about for a start. Which, yeah. Let's go to Kit. <laughs> Has Kit fallen asleep? Hello. Talking no, about? he just <laughs> muted your nonsense. I, I wasn't listening to the football at all. Um, it went Good on football, football you instantly and I got just more didn't get it. <laughs> That's a great reaction. Okay, so for my greatest sporting moment, I've gone a bit controversial because I'm not going to pick a trophy winner or someone who ran fast or overcoming some fluky thing the way you go down in, in a league. Because for me, the greatest sporting moment has to be ridiculous, sublime shithousery. <laughs> and so I have gone for the 1904 St. Louis Olympic Marathon and the insane hijinks that it involved. Now, the Olympics in St. Louis were purely political. They were designed to coincide with the World's Fair and the 100th anniversary of the Louisiana Purchase. However, the World's Fair meant the Olympics had to be held between anthropology days, uh, events such as the greasy pole climb, the ethnic dance-off, and mudslinging, because I wish I was making this up, there was a human zoo there uh, of people from around the world. Because of the Russo-Japanese War, Uh, 108 foreign athletes were the only ones who could attend from 12 countries, including 56 from Canada. The rest were from the United States. Indeed, the football competition was won by the Golf Football Club of Canada. Uh, Great Britain attended with six people and won two medals, both from Irish competitors. And Cuba, who sent only three competitors, one we'll come on to in a moment, won four gold, two silver and three bronze. Otherwise, the US dominated They won events such as the tug of war, croquet and the standing box jump, whatever that is, to claim 78 gold medals and 239 medals in total. The hero of the games was a guy called George Iser, an American gymnast who won six medals, including gold in the vault, parallel bars and 20 foot rope climb. But this is quite remarkable because he only had one leg. He got hit by a train and so competed with a wooden prosthetic. Uh, he remained the only person to complete with, uh, compete in the Olympics with prosthesis until 2008. But none of this matters compared to the craziness of the marathon. So, as you know, a marathon is 26.2 miles, right? Not at St. Louis, they only ran for 24. Uh, none of the Greek competitors knew how long a marathon was either. And because uh, they, of that, they turned up and none of them had actually run over 10 miles before. Uh, one of the Americans, Fred Lortz, Uh, was a bricklayer who got his place by showing that he could manage just about to stagger over five miles, while the Cuban Felix Cabral got his place by walking the length of Cuba for sponsorship. Unfortunately, on the way to the Games, Cabral got involved in a dice game in New Orleans, lost all of his money and had to hitchhike the way there across America. He also forgot to bring any sports clothes and so started the race in a beret, street shoes, a long sleeve shirt and trousers. Someone actually found a pair of scissors to cut his trousers around and make shorts. Two of the competitors in the marathon were actually part of South Africa's contribution to this human zoo thing I mentioned and arrived barefoot dressed as Zulu tribesmen. Anyway, uh, 3 p.m. in the afternoon, the race begins and it is 32 degrees Celsius. It is baking hot. No one knew how to lay out a course at St. Louis. So they had arranged for people to run down roads that were covered in several inches of dust. This was classic Dust Bowl territory and over seven hills and through the middle of St. Louis. Only they had forgotten to cordon off the area. So competitors had to dodge traffic, trains and even even people walking around while they were doing the race. There were only two water stops for the entire 24 miles 
because the organizer, James Sullivan, wanted to run a human experiment on deliberate dehydration and thought this was an ideal scientific test. I am not making this up. So they begin these 24 miles in scorching 32 degree heat and unsurprisingly runners begin to collapse because there is no water. Uh, William Garcia is hemorrh it's, uh, starts hemorrhaging because of all the dust. It's actually ripped out his stomach lining and he is hospitalized. John Lorden starts vomiting and quits. And one of the South Africans, a guy called Len Tao, is chased off the course by a pack of wild dogs and finds himself completely lost in downtown St. Louis. The early leader is a guy called Thomas Hicks, uh, who soon becomes dehydrated and needs the help of two men uh, to keep running. So these people are actually just carrying him along the course. Eventually, his handlers get fed up of this and they decide to inject him with strychnine and egg whites. This is the first evidence of doping at the Olympics, which was legal at the time. And fortunately, it perks Hicks up and he gives him the strength to continue. And all the way along, they keep sticking him with strychnine. That's quite important. Now, Carvajal, uh, the Cuban, as I mentioned, he did OK, but he liked to stop and chat to people. And at one occasion, he stops some, some uh, passers-by and he steals peaches from them. They chase him into a, fru a fruit orchard <laughs> where he decides, fantastic, I've got loads of fruit here, and he starts eating apples. Unfortunately, the apples that have fallen to the ground are rotten and he starts getting stomach cramps. So he throws up a bit and then takes a nap. While this is all going on, one guy is clearly in the lead, uh, and that is Lort, the bricklayer. Uh, he finishes the marathon in a time of just under three hours, and there to greet him is the daughter of the president, Alice Roosevelt. And she is overseeing the race. She walks up to him. She presents the gold medal. She's about to hand over a, a laurel wreath to, to crown him when someone yells that Lort is a cheat. And it turns out that after 10 miles, he got tired and he jumped into a cab and got a lift 10 miles along the course. He'd actually used a car. Uh, so Lortz was instantly disqualified and claimed it was just all a practical joke. That left Hicks in the lead being constantly stuck up the bum with strychnine. At this point, uh, he was hallucinating, convinced there was still another 20 miles to go. In fact, he was a few hundred meters from the end. Unable to continue, however, his trainers had to pick him up and carry him with legs, with Hicks's legs swinging around as if he was still running while being carried over the line. Uh, crossing the line, he was immediately attended by four different doctors before he was capable of standing and collecting his medal. He was almost dead of strychnine poisoning. Second uh, was an African-American called Albert Correa, and third was Arthur Newton, another American. Fourth, bizarrely, was Carvajal, who after his nap had felt a lot better and almost caught up with his rivals. So there you go. That is the craziness of the St. Louis, Mar St. Louis Marathon. And for me, for its just bonkersness, it is the greatest sporting moment in history. John just seems overwhelmed by this part of his country's history that he didn't know about. <laughs> He's just like gobsmacked. I just have this image of this guy being carried with, uh, hopped up on strychnine, which I think is used to kill people. Uh, his legs flying around like uh, the description Alex gave us a couple minutes ago of uh, the Tottenham match. <laughs> the marathon, the marathon in the Olympics back in the de back in the olden days is gr is ripe for this type of stuff. Anyway, I mean, Kit, you did, you mentioned the the distance of it, but the reason that it's 26 miles and 385 yards now is in the 1908 Olympics, the marathon was going to start at Windsor Castle and finish at White City. And that is the length of the marathon track from the night of the Olympics. So, so everyone thinks it goes back to, you know, the Battle of Marathon, et cetera, but that's why the marathon length is the marathon length. And in, in the 1908 Olympics, the favourite was an Italian, and he finished first, but when he got into the stadium, he collapsed. And people helped him up, and he collapsed four times. He was eventually helped over the line. He still finished first, but he was disqualified because he received assistance in the stadium. But his excuse for collapsing was that someone had... He had some champagne halfway around the course and someone had obviously stuck a drug in it, which is like brilliant. Yeah, I mean, champagne is one of those things. The, at the 1913 uh, Indy 500, uh, the Peugeot team entered. It was one of the first time there an international team had entered. And each pit stop, they picked up a bottle of champagne and they were drinking it while they were doing the Indy 500. 
Um, they actually won, uh, both of them plastered. Uh, the guy who came third in that race, his car caught fire halfway through and he got his mechanic out on the bonnet, beating down the flames as he drove around a fireball around the Indy course. So all of this kind of stuff happens in the early 20th century. But for me, the Lewis Marathon is just the peak. Health and safety has just ruined the world, hasn't it, Zach? I'm liking this. This is my kind of way of doing sports. You know, you, you jump in a cab when you can't be bothered to finish running the race. That seems very sensible. Get people to carry you over part of the course. I'd definitely have been up for circuits if, if that was how it was done. Lots of drugs involved. This is a contender kit. I'm liking it. OK, let's go to... Who have we got left? Wave your hand if you haven't been yet. Let's go to Chris, who's going to talk oh, okay. to... Um... Marcus, in depth about Gillingham's finest hour, aren't you? <laughs> well, actually, that was one of my uh, three choices um, originally. Um, I wanted to do um, the the three greatest foot, um, sporting moments that I've seen in my lifetime. Um, one of them um, was poss- possibly my favourite was the Euro '96 semi-final oh, penalty shut shootout up. between it's England German and German wanker. Um, and and. <laughs> And that's why I didn't do it. <laughs> that, that... The memory of anything is the Italia 90 um, shootout and Chris Waddle. And to this day, that Pat, uh, Pavarotti doing that high note in Lesson Dorma makes me cry. Oh, I mean, the, the other options were... Uh, OK, um, I'll, I'll skip the one about my daughter high-fiving the team on because obviously no one cares about that. So, <clears throat> right. That, tell so Marcus I, um, about I went to work. great detail. <laughs> Well, it was a Gillingham ladies team and um, my daughter who has a severe, uh, she's got um, spastic paraplegia and she can't walk properly. Mm-hmm. Um, so for her fourth birthday, because uh, she, she'd always wanted to play football, I made a, a mention on Twitter about it and the Gillingham ladies team said they'd quite like Sophie to come and um, meet the team. And so she did and she got to high five, got walk out on the pitch in a little walker and high five everyone on for her fourth birthday. There you was, go, um, shit on that floor. Yes. Well. Philistines. Yeah. Are we judging that one? Because I feel really bad. Yeah, good. I hope we do. <laughs> I mean, it's got nothing to do with football, um, but I, you know, I want to support Chris's daughter, so it's nice. Yeah, I completely agree. It's not a greatest sporting <laughs> moment. It's just people being basically kind, which is being really very good. kind. Yeah. Um. Well, anyway, I, I'm like Zach and um, Marcus. Uh, that I was never very good at sport. Um, always got picked last, um, accidentally hit my PE teacher on the head with a cricket ball when he was stood 90 degrees from me and I was throwing forward. Um, and so I went to work and I was saying, God, what am I going to do for, for sport? So my uh, colleague, Jerry, uh, went through uh, the internet and she found this for me. And um, it has nothing to do with boats, but um, it has to do with um, male misogyny and uh, fighting prejudice. Uh, so in 1966, the uh, Boston Marathon... Um, Although women weren't prohibited from running uh, the marathon, they were only allowed to run a mile and a half because, as the uh, Boston uh, Athletic Associate Director, Will Cloney, said, um, that women are um, physiologically incapable of running 26 miles. Uh, And despite the rule book saying, you know, there's nothing to stop women from running, he said, well, these are the argue with it. Um, But in 1966, uh, Roberta Gibb, who had trained for two years, uh, hidden, hidden the, the uh, crowd watching, and as the race commenced, she ran out on amongst the run, runners and actually ran the full 26 miles, and um, gained quite a lot of um, uh, media attention from it. Uh, she did it in a total of three hours and 21 mi- minutes. But she's not the person I want to speak about because in the 1967 um, Boston Marathon, we have uh, Catherine Stitzer, who was born in Hamburg. Um, Deutschland. Unfortunately, she was American, not German. Um, <clears throat> uh, but uh, she moved back to America, uh, trained uh, at Syracuse uh, University as part of the Syracuse Harriers race team, where her coach, um, Arnie Briggs, um, told her that um, there's no way that a woman, a fragile little woman could run a marathon. And in the end, he gave up, he gave uh, enough to her, said, if any woman can run the marathon, it's going to be you but you need to prove it to me in trials. And if you can run 26 miles, I will drive you to Boston myself. She ran the 26 miles. So they entered her in. uh, When she filled out the forms, because um, people had misspelled her name in before and there was a mistake on a birth certificate, her signature was just K.V. Spitzer. Um, 
so no one knew that she was a woman until the day that she actually rocked up to claim her numbers. So she climbed out um, amongst all the other runners, and the runners, uh, most of the runners were okay with it. They're like, cool, yeah, that's nice. You, the woman running, that's brilliant. And they made her feel really welcome. And so did some of the crowd, as they, they had Gib the previous year. And um, the pistol went, she started running. And um, one of the uh, race officials, uh, a Jack Semple, actually ran out to try and stop her from running. And she, he tried to grab her numbers. And uh, the exact words he said were something along the lines of, um, get off my race course, give me those numbers. Um, and he, he tried to grab her. He actually managed to get one of her gloves off. Unfortunately for him, um, her um, spit friend, who, who was an ex-college football player and a hammer thrower, I think he was, I can't remember how much he weighed. I can't read it because I'm not worried. 23, uh, 235 pound hammer throwing boyfriend came hurtling out towards him and decked him. Um, how, uh, if, if you Google it, the, the pictures are fantastic. But she said that um, in, uh, as she was running with this guy chasing him, she said, uh, instinct- instinctively, I jerked my head around and looked square into the, fa- into the most um, vicious face I had ever seen. Um, he began, um, he had bare, t- bare teeth and was set to pounce. Or, pounce. And before I could react, um, to get um, get the hell out. Um, he, sorry, I wrote this on the train, so it's a bit jolted and I can't read my own writing. Uh, he grabbed my shoulder and flung me back, sneering, get the hell out of my race and give me those numbers. Um, Semple would later say that um, she only got her numbers on a technicality and that she shouldn't have been there and she was just an interloper. Um, again, coming back to the really beautiful Will Colney, Cloney, he actually said that... Um, about her in 19, uh, later, that if she had been his daughter, he would have spanked her. Kinky. Um, she actually completed the race in um, four hours and something. Not, not as quite as good as Gibb, but she actually made the full race. And, uh, but because of it, the AAU banned women from racing in the, in, at all. Um, they weren't allowed to race with men at all. And um, it wasn't until the 1972 uh, marathons that they actually allowed allowed women to race. But uh, Spitzer said this, and it's like Lord of the Rings. There are many endings to this to this quote, but you have to bear with me. Um, that if she quit, she would be um, she would let everyone like Semple win. That she would be allowing the uh, misogynistic patriarchy to win, and that she would be quit if she quit, she'd be quitting for womankind everywhere. And so um, I'm suggesting the 1967 um, marathon is the greatest um, sporting event because it actually proved to uh, sexist men in the 1960s and up to 1972 that women are just as capable as men. And how dare you try and stop them trying to compete? Uh, And also uh, just another factoid that Jerry gave me before I came on was that uh, in a previous uh, marathon, um, men weren't allowed to race at the same time as the women. So the women had a head start and, uh, the pistol went and the women all sat down and waited for the men's gun to go because they weren't going to go until they went. So yeah, I, I, I'd like to argue the 1967 uh, race was the uh, most important because screw you, men, women can run. They can indeed. Marcus. Yeah. Women can run. I yeah, not arguing that. Um, yeah. It's quite an interesting one. I, there was kind of like two or three rolled into one. So I will comment on the overall women's rights in sport being important yeah it's a nice uh point to go for overall uh, it's hard to know which one to kind of concentrate on i do quite like the idea of a fist fight halfway through a running race i think it might sport it up a bit but then i'm reminded that champagne and coughing up so much blood and being supportive through it so i kind of go back to kit's one so i'm, I'm directly comparing it with that which just had a bit more drama in it maybe so it's kind of linking into each other a bit there and i do you like the idea of the danger in sports, I think? Zach? I, I like this one. I mean, you started with the hitting the PE teacher in the face with a cricket ball, which I thought was a massive contender, because I would have loved to have done that <laughs> to my PE teachers, all of them. Um, I'll, I'll tell that story later. There's a thing with a javelin as well. <laughs> I hope the javelin you that child that the PE teacher just devastatingly didn't want anywhere near them aren't you? You're that child that re- you're the reason that we had to have long safety briefings before sport. <laughs> <laughs> you, 
you were the reason we had turbo javelins, the plastic ones with the fins rather than the pointy metal ones. <laughs> oh, so. No way. That at, sucks. At my school, a mate of mine knocked himself out while throwing the javelin. He got the angle wrong and smacked himself <laughs> on the back of the head. <laughs> With the Boston Marathon thing, did she win? Sorry, sorry, I just have to add Tosser. No, she didn't win. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't win. No, uh, I, I'm afraid she didn't. No, no. So essentially, this is she came in with the respect. Respect. It's it's the official up though, which is quite funny. Yeah, it's it's funny. I'm just, I mean, yeah. I go back to the point about childbirth. If you need proof that women are better than men, childbirth. Um, so I, I'm with you on the kind of the whole misogyny thing. But did it change anything substantially in terms it, of it, people's attitudes? It, it, it did because it, it allowed women to, um, because women weren't allowed to race for more than a mile and a half. But because of the um, runs of Gibb and Switzer, by the 1972, um, when they finally allowed women to race with men again, they were allowed to run the full marathon distance. So it did, it did change things. Um, Gibb had a massive uh, run in the media, including uh, Sports Illustrated, that did a whole thing about, look at this woman, she's run 24 miles. We didn't think they could do that. And um, it, Although it, it, John it did point people... out, and I did have to chuckle, John stoked the controversy and said, but if she couldn't even outrun the official who was nagging her on her way around. <laughs> <laughs> her boyfriend got him, tracked him down. <laughs> Okay, I quite like that one. And we have had a diverse bunch of sports, haven't we? Let's go to, we've got three left. Let's go to Holmes. Yeah, I mean, uh, in a, in, this won't surprise anyone, but I'm going for football again. But I'm, I think there is an element of history to this. I think there is a slight element of military history to this. And even better, it doesn't involve a single reference to Kieran Richardson as well. So <laughs> I don't even know who that is. You weren't, listening, you weren't taking proper notes for Beth's then, were you? Mm. Uh, my notes consist of something football, points for delivery, long and hard winter, most exciting thing isn't actually what's happening on the pitch. That's my notes for Beth. I'm, I'm sorry, Beth. You know I adore you, but just it, this wasn't a good one. Wasn't so. he the captain of HMS Chapter? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, as far as, I'm that. as far as I'm concerned, the greatest sporting moment in history is without doubt the first ever FA Cup final, took place between the Royal Engineers and the Wanderers at the Oval Cricket Ground on the 16th of March, 1872. It's not necessarily the greatest sporting moment in history because of what happened on the pitch that day, but because of how it came into being and the legacy it created, the effects of which can still be felt to this day. The Football Association was formed in 1863 with the intention of codifying the sport by producing a consistent set of laws that would apply across all football matches. Once this had been completed, the FA had to come up with another idea that would bring the country's teams together. Up to this point, all games had been local friendlies. The public school teams of the South did not play the teams from the industrialised North, and a competition which would see teams from across the nation playing each other seemed the best way of achieving this. The FA Cup, created in 1871, is the oldest domestic cup competition in world football, and prior to its introduction, no regular competitive football matches were played in England. In a meeting of the FA Committee in July of that year, Charles Alcock proposed that a Challenge Cup competition should be established and all clubs who were members of the Football Association should be invited to participate. The development of the railways has significantly reduced the burden of travel and so the idea of teams from all over the country playing each other was now logistically far more straightforward than it had been previously. Invitations were sent out to the 50 clubs that were members of the FA, however, just 15 of them bothered to respond. Three more teams subsequently withdrew, which meant 12, 12 clubs took part. The first round of games taking place on the 11th of November 1871 saw the following fixtures. Wanderers versus Harrow Checkers, Civil Service versus Barnes, Crystal Palace, not the current Crystal Palace, versus Hitchin, Queen's Park from Glasgow versus Donington Grammar School, Royal Engineers versus Rygate Priory, and Upton Park versus Clapham Rovers. Just over four months later, Wanderers and the Royal Engineers were the only two, two, only two teams left in the competition when they lined up to face each other at Kennington in front of 2,000 spectators who had all paid one shilling, who had all paid the one shilling admission price. Wanderers, who had only made it to the final after the Scottish team Queen's Park could not afford to travel to London for the second leg of the semi-final, were captained by Charles, Charles Alcock, the man who had come up with the idea of the cup, whilst the Royal Engineers team was comprised of two captains, 
eight lieutenants and a, one second lieutenant. Wanderers had the best players and they favoured a simple dribbling tactic, similar to rooks, mauls and uh, scrums in rugby. Yet the Royal Engineers, who employed a more progressive passing game, the Barcelona of their day, were favourites. The teams kicked off on a pitch which did not include a centre circle or halfway line. The goals had no crossbars or nets and there were no free kicks or penalties under the laws of the game at that time. After 10 minutes, the Royal Engineers suffered an injury when Lieutenant Cresswell broke his collarbone. It was the first recorded accident in football, but the injured player manfully, in, but the injured player manfully stayed at his post. Five minutes later, wonder, the Wanderers forward, Morton Betts, scored past the Engineers keeper, William Merriman, and put the Wanderers 1-0 up. Alcock's men kept their 1-0 lead and went on to secure a victory. The Morning Post included the following match report. The officers of the Royal Engineers and the celebrated Wanderers played their final contest for the Association Challenge Cup. There was a vast number of spectators, including many ladies in the tent. So that covers off the lady part, Zach, because I know that's a big thing that you're listening for tonight. And there were several open landers on the ground. The ball was kick- kicked off at three o'clock, and after a scrimmage, the Wanderers got the ball down towards the Engineers, who had a downfall of their lines by a well-directed kick by E. Checkers. Many battles were fought and with no other result. It was a perfectly one-sided match, the Wanderers taking it comparatively easily. The engineers could never get within many yards of their opponent's course. I know it sounds like basically the man who scored played under a, uh, under, a, under a false name for some reason. So that's why he was referred to in the report as E. Checkers, but that wasn't his real name. Why that was, who knows. The cup was eventually presented to Charles Alcock, captain of the victorious team, almost a month later at Wanderers' annual, annual dinner at the Palmar restaurant. One short-lived early initiative of the Cup was that the winners received a bye to the final for the following year, although this was quietly dropped after a couple of seasons as it was deemed bad for competition. As an aside, Charles Aldcock is buried in West Norwood Cemetery and you can visit his grave and it has the first FA Cup carved into his headstone. The FA Cup would continue to grow. By 1888, 149 sides had registered to participate in that year's competition. It paved the way for the Football League and the rise of professionalism in football, which itself helped football to become the nation's favourite sport after its its adoption by the working classes. The FA Cup remains the longest-running domestic domestic cup competition, and despite some concerns that it's not what it once was, it still appears to be the one cup competition that players want to win. The game between the Wanderers and the Royal Engineers played at Kennington almost 148 years ago may not have been the finest game of football ever played, but without it, we may not have had the Football League and other, fo- other football competitions such as the Champions League or perhaps even the World Cup. And on that basis, it's hard to argue against its greatness. I really like this one. Uh, but can you just read out at the very beginning uh, the purpose of forming the Football Association? What was the first one? It was the intention of codifying the sport by producing a consistent set of laws. Yeah, and then along came VAR. Yeah. <laughs> Outstanding, Zach. I yes. can answer for Zach. Basically, it's not, not going to win because it's football. <laughs> there we go. What Beth Zach said, but, like but there, were, there were some points in favour of this one. I mean, again, it seemed like the most exciting thing. I think Holmes kind of said this himself was not what was actually not the actual sporting prowess. It was the other stuff. Um, I mean, he mentioned that it was the first recorded injury in football. Didn't Edward III ban football in his army because his soldiers were dying? So, uh, I, I don't well, know. Presumably, this is football that. after the rules have been codified and not the sort of Shrove Tuesday get a big foot, big ball from one side of the town to the other where everybody got injured. Mm, okay, fair enough. I mean, army engineers not running off crying after an injury. Well, it's it's better than football today, I guess, but it's also kind of classic army, you know, just gut up and get on with it. Um, so, so, better than the footballers who like to fall over because they think that they're going to lose and the best way to try and score I mean, either, the, either that or he went down for a free kick and was really milking it and the lack of medical technology allowed him to get away with it. Well, the reason that penalties don't exist, well, penalties don't exist at this point, but they came in in about 1911, is that right, Holmes? We had to cover that for our book. And the hilarious thing was people were like, well, this is ridiculous because it just prompts the idea that someone might throw themselves on the floor to try and get one. Well, like, when, when penalties actually came in, which was... I can't remember exactly when it was, um, but because of the public school sporting ethos, the yeah. goalie would leave the goal. He would just think, well, <laughs> you've been fouled, therefore it, it would be cheating of me to even try and save this. So I will stand aside from the goal and you can just slot it in. Yeah, they clearly had never met Luis Suarez, had they? 
Marcus? I missed all the last couple of references, I'm afraid. But, yeah, I know this one, uh, and I quite like it. And actually, I, I really respect the fact that Holmes is going on, on brand and staying within World War One because I like to bore people with Napoleonics. And I think this is quite good. I'm, I was a bit afraid of saying it's good because I was going to go... The was in 1872, Marcus. But, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> uh, these guys went on... These, a lot of these... A lot of these guys went on to um, to fight and serve in later conflicts, um, which is why I, it's a, it's quite a common um, army pub quiz answer. But I'm a bit afraid of saying I like it because everyone's going to go, oh, it's football, you, therefore you say you like it. But I like the fact that you found something a bit different. And yeah, it's the only time that a military team has won the FA Cup. Which, so it's I mean, quite I think, unique. I think a, a, it's, you know quite old proper history b there, there is a winner here unlike yes. some of the ones we've heard tonight and um c it's his legacy i mean his legacy is enormous yeah it's still yeah, no how i, many I people do tend worldwide to agree watch the fa cup final do we know how many people still tune in it, it's oh. like over a billion it's something ridiculous yeah. like that it is absolutely insane isn't it it's just like even like little kids kicking a ball of elastic bands around in a favela somewhere know what the fa cup is i mean definitely that's not exaggerating in the slightest. I also so yeah, my only negative point is it's Royal Engineers, and as a as a proud gunner, I've got to take a few points off there. But I genuinely quite like the story. Uh, it, I know they didn't have any time to train, and they came from all over the place, so uh, quite impressive. Yeah. yeah. But as a proud gunner, that would have meant Woolwich Arsenal would have won it, and then we could never, given what they went on to become, we I would have never have done that in the first place. So no. I think they would be all, all their talented. Now. All their talented they were manufacturers down at Blackheath Rugby Club, anyway. <laughs> go on, Lockie, give, give us a rugger. Yeah, go on, Lockie. Are you going to do rugby? No. Really? No, I'm not. Oh. Wow. Yeah, I'm not. Who was expecting 2003 England World Cup win? Everyone yes. put their hand up. No, no, oh, no, no. Charlie doesn't um, know what you're talking about. <laughs> Do you know, I did think about it, of course, but, um, I, I, but then I came up with some criteria, as I try and do for these things, and one of my criteria was um, high drama and surprise, and I, I don't want to take anything away from England winning the World Cup, because it's brilliant, of course it is, but they went into the tournament as the number one team in the world, and duly won, which is excellent, um, but well, I don't think... You're going to do Torval and Dean? <laughs> well, I'm doing the Olympics, not not those Olympics. <laughs> um, so, what are my criteria? Uh, high drama and surprise. Actually, I wanted some surprise in there. I wanted stellar performances with the best sportsmen and women, uh, and I wanted genuine euphoria and joy. Um, so, I came up with a Super Saturday 2012, um, Saturday August the fourth. 2012. It's nice to be able to talk about August the 4th without talking about a declaration of war, uh, of course, but um, uh, like all good stories, we're going to start in Eton. Um, <laughs> Eton Dorney, uh, actually, because um, our, our story starts with some rowing. Now, um, this was the second weekend of the Olympics and um, I, I remember spending a lot of time in front of the TV because, you know, you could you could switch between different sports uh, going on. If you were sensible and British, you were starting with the rowing that day because if there is one event or one um, particular discipline that the British have nailed down, it is the men's coxless fours. Um, we have this sorted out uh, and have done since 2000. We've run it every single time. Now, we take nothing for granted actually, um, because we'd managed to fuck up the um, men's road race quite spectacularly, having been nailed on favourites for that one as well, the cycling. I'm talking about a couple of days before where we'd balls up and let a breakaway go and uh, having the Tour de France winner and Mark Cavendish made absolutely no difference there. So you don't like to take anything for granted, but this one should be good. And it duly was. Uh, who was our team? Gregory Reed, James and Triggs Hodge and um, took the lead in the first few seconds and duly powered on. Never never ran away with it. It was a good race. Australia um, came second, and they were within a third of a boat length. Um, but it was a gold for Britain early on. Nice. Good start. Um, if you were following the form book, you immediately switched over to the velodrome and what was going on over there. If you did, you would have missed another gold medal for Britain in the rowing. 
Um, and we had the, it's, it's a bit of a switch, the men's coxless fours, extremely heavy guys, massive six foot six plus uh, ex, you know, units uh, in the boat. Um, the lightweight women's double skulls uh, we had uh, next. Um, which was Cutland and Husking, and that was quite a race as well, actually, um, because they were not favourites uh, going into it at all. Uh, they didn't take the lead until after the halfway point, uh, but when they did take the lead, they roared away, and by the end of it, there was daylight between them and, uh, and the Greek and Chinese teams who finished in second and third, um, and it's amazing. I've, I've gone through all of these, watching them all again. I actually got quite emotional watching it. It's really kind of exciting and the thought that we, we'll, we may never experience something like this again. But, um, yeah, Catherine Copeland um, in the boat looking absolutely um, stunned, really. And, and Sophie Hosking, her, her partner, sort of turning around in the boat. Uh, and Copeland, sort of, you can see her mouthing, did we just win the Olympics? Um, to a, Yes, we did. Uh, and, then the, and then the celebration starts. So two gold medals uh, into the day so far. Let's go to the velodrome now. And so they did. Um, oh, we love the velodrome uh, in the Olympics. Well, just cycling generally, to be fair. Um, we'd already had by this stage, by Saturday, um, gold in the men's time trial. Uh, Bradley Wiggins, Tour de France winner, had gone on and won that one. Uh, at least. Uh, the men's team pursuit and the women's Kieran, uh, we'd had golds there. It's time for the women's team pursuit final, um, and which had rumbled on. They had had the heats the previous day, and they had the semis uh, earlier that day. Uh, and the team pursuit is that one where they have three of them that have to bang around the velodrome as fast as they can, in theory, chasing the other team. You very rarely catch the other team, uh, of course, because they're usually pretty much as good as you um but the british girls had been on fire um just before canada had pipped australia to bronze in a really really tight close game um the final was great britain versus the usa uh, and uh, king trot and rousel absolutely blew the americans to bits um so to the point where they were almost catching uh, them up on the ray way around they were almost robotic in their precision and the way they finished almost like in a perfect v formation oh just it, it's, it's years of training and just perfection uh, that brings that around so we haven't got into the olympic stadium yet and we've got three superb goals one to be fair was a bit of a shock the other two were just great ones now into the olympic stadium and here's where kind of my personal memory comes into this because i was running a pub at the time and it was packed everywhere i had given myself the night off such was my prerogative so i was um having a, a beverage or two uh, as we watched on the big screens and what did we have in the olympic stadium that evening well we had at least one where we thought right this is fairly nailed on and that's jessica ennis uh the women's heptathlon was finishing that day um, they'd already gone through um, four of the seven events and Jess, uh, by the, the previous day this is, uh, and Jess was in the lead. Um, she had nailed the 100 metres hurdles. That was the first event. And she actually ran a time which was good enough for fourth place in the main event itself, the women's 100 metres hurdles. So she smashed that. Uh, she's a bit less good at throwing things. Um, though so she she came sort of 10th place in the shot and the javelin um, did creditably uh, in the high jump considering she's a she's a very small person uh, came fifth but nailed the 200 meters uh, as well so she's in a very strong position going into a strong event of hers and the women in second and third place um, uh, were good at throwing things and not at running. So the last event was the 800 metres. Uh, she was expected to win gold, and that's what we had a focus on. We also had a bit of a focus on Mo Farah, um, who had the 10,000 metres uh, to come. High hopes, but you know we'll, we'll kind of get to that. Uh, and out of nowhere came Ginger Zebedee. Uh, and I'll talk about him uh, for a second as well. No, actually, we'll go, go into him uh, now because um, <laughs> this was exciting. The thing with the Olympic Stadium, because it cuts around between different events. 
uh, all the time. You're sort of looking at one thing and then all of a sudden someone starts cheering and you don't really know why. And it could be someone you know, that we like has just gone out for a warm up lap or something like that. Or Usain Bolt's come out and give people a wave or, 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 or who knows. Uh, but while we're getting ready for the heptathlon, the men's long jump gets going. Um, and there were some Brits in this and that we didn't have very high medal hopes. Um, Chris Tomlinson, we kind of knew of, was OK. Um, but Greg Rutherford. Uh, comes along and what a what a game here actually after the first round of the final Tomlinson uh, had the lead um, with you know eight meters and six no one jumped that, that far really uh, but in the second round of the long jump Rutherford launched himself um, eight meters and 21 and he took the lead all right we're cheering Jess Ennis then has her run uh, and 800 meters you know to be honest she would have needed to fall it over a break a leg or something to, to not get gold. So the commentators were all pretty chill, but she stormed out and took a lead. Brilliant. She's charging around the track and away she goes. And then, oh, sadness with about 150 meters to go. She gets overtaken by the Russian and German athletes and we think, oh, it's okay. Oh, well, never mind. She's still going to win gold. And we actually kind of lose sight of, of Jess for a second because the German and Russian athletes are much bigger than she is. And it's the back straight and she's kind of hidden behind these big unit but then she just burns the pair of them on the home straight so we've gone from oh it's okay never mind she's still gonna win gold to come on Jess and through she charges uh and not just takes the gold but does it so emphatically with a huge win in the 800 yeah 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 we're all cheering next up of course is the men's 10,000 on the track but Ginger Zebedee has launched himself again he's powered himself out to eight meters 31 he's storming ahead in the long jump Whoa. Well, and this is still going to go on while the men's 10,000 has started. They get themselves into start position. Jumpers are still jumping away. The cheers when Mo Farah's name is announced is just like something else. You can see all these athletes. They're totally in the zone. They're very, very prepared and very, very serious. But then as soon as this stadium announcer calls them, if they're a British athlete, it's just an eruption. They can't help but smile. It really is something else. Anyway, 10,000 metres gets going. There's still athletes jumping in the long jump. So we're watching to see if Clay, the American fella, uh, is going to out jump in. We have round five and round six um, in, the, in the long jump. And some Australian fella, Mitchell Watt um, jumps himself into contention, jumps himself into a medal place, but but no one no one actually beats Rutherford. Um, so while Mo Farah is starting to run, another gold medal comes in for Britain, and it's kind of for the, for the ten thousand meters. It's kind of good that that um, long jump drama is going on because you know it's a long race, ten thousand meters. Actually, it takes a little while, even at the pace that they run. So the first quarter of it is taken up with Greg Rutherford um, as as the gold medalist and and doing his kind of waving around and 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 little kind of charge with him. I'm basically going to skip the ten thousand meters up to because it's twenty five laps of the track. I think we can skip the first twenty two because actually it's it's pretty slow. Uh, the kind of the first bit and, and it's he, he, he was. Far from a nailed-on winner for this one. Um, I think the uh, the favourite really was uh, Kenanisa Bekele, the, the, the Ethiopian uh, fellow who was the 2008 Beijing gold medalist. He was the Olympic record holder. He's the world record holder. If anyone's going to beat Mo, it's, it's this fella. And he spent a lot of time on the front of this. But with three laps to go, the pace quickens up, the field stretches out, and you've got two Ethiopians, a Kenyan and Mo, leading the pack away. With two laps to go, uh, Mo is on the front. And then the best ding ding and Mo sets off and really no one looks like getting him from that point he stretches them out he doesn't lose touch completely so even with about 100 meters to go you think oh shit has he blown it no he hasn't because he powers down the home straight Mo Farah wins it's this build up through the day of gold medal after gold medal after brilliant success after wonderful story and the feeling of euphoria was just atomic. Um, you had the British cleaning up in on the highest stage possible at the Olympics in event after event, different things, wonderful stories all through the way. And for that reason, I'm going to say Super Saturday, the greatest photo sporting moment in history. It's wonderful. It's brilliant. And you know what? I'm not having. There's been some chat about the fact that it's not one event and that it is. Because I said a sporting event, you could have had the whole fucking London Olympics for all I care. You're cheating less now than you were when you did the pub the other week and you won. 
um, 48 you. minutes, three gold medals. And coming from if you've been British and watched fucking Athens, or I think I think I probably just about remember how excited the country was at the thought of five gold medals in the whole Olympics in Barcelona, and that everybody was quite enthralled with that. Um, I do know one of one of my old Etonian chums who's well into his 80s got uh, one of the. Uh, corporate tickets for that night and I'm so pleased that of all the people I know it was him that got to be sitting on the home straight as well to watch all of that happen um, but I wonder if it would have been yes the euphoria in the stadium but I wonder if it would have built in quite the way it did with the TV cutting backwards and forwards um, but ironically I had to watch the whole thing in France because I was on a battlefield thing I was also in France watching it as well and it was absolutely fantastic. I was, I was in a villa in the south of France with my family and it was owned by British people and they had Sky and we just sat and watched it and absolutely like, I think I was about, well, oh, I can't remember, I think I was about 18 at the time and just jumping up and down like, you know, just absolutely screaming at the television like every time it was like, ah! it was it was a fantastic day. I remember when when Rutherford won, and that was a surprise. Like we, we were expecting Ennis to to come home, not to roar home like that, maybe. But like when Rutherford won his goal, I remember saying to the other people around me, uh, "Right, if Mo wins, I am drinking tonight." And that's that's not just you know me having a few beers. That's this this kind of capitalised um, drink drinking, and he, he he went on and did it, and it was just super like. And like you say, screaming at the TV, everyone in the pub screaming, "Go on, Mo!" And I remember like the footage of the commentators. You saw that you saw the BBC lot in the in the commentary box, and Colin Jackson and um, who else was there? Uh, Michael Johnson. You know, it, they're all jumping up and down as well. It just had that effect on people. Zach, any comments? A uh, couple of comments. You know me, I'm a sceptic on sport. Uh, none of what I've got to say is... I can see where Lockie's going with this. This was a, a this is a decent kind of contribution. Charlie raised an objection, which I'd sustain, which is that basically what Lockie's done is claimed an entire day of sporting achievements and has tried to pass them off on one event. So I'm with you there, Charlie. Um, but I think this whole thing about Super Saturday is basically everyone was surprised that Team GB wasn't as crap as we'd expected. And so that's what makes this the great achievement that it is, rather than anything else. God, I just I don't think you can take away from that by that point as well. It's not just his day in isolation, is it, Lockie? The the Olympics had built. You've got to the middle weekend, so this was where um, the, this is the big big night. This Saturday is always the big night for. Um, for the athletics. Yeah, I mean, there'd already been some great golds. I mean, um, the, the, I know I mentioned the velodrome, but you'd had um, you'd, you'd had the men's time trial. Yeah, you'd had well. some. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. There'd, there'd been some surprise golds and some, you know, and some of these had built up over a couple of days. So um, Rutherford had jumped well in the heats the day before, uh, and obviously Ennis had done well the day oh, before. But it's like Ennis um, had been. It was. Do you know what? It's the reason that if I was going to do an athletics, I'd do the greatest moment as Kelly Holmes's double gold because she had missed out so many times through injury um, and through things that were no fault of her own and for it all to come good on the last time it could have come good for her and to do it I think that adds to it as well and I think at that point there was a rolling momentum starting to build on the London Olympics that actually sort of transcended sport in the country. The thing that I always remember from Super Saturday is as Jess Ennis crossed the line and got gold and she looked up and it said Jess Ennis gold medal the look of relief on that poor girl's face. Mm -hmm. Because she'd been the face of those Olympics for six years. Yeah. The pressure the that thing, was on oh, her. Isn't it? It's the fact that as soon as you get given them eight years before, that's when they start pumping the money in because every country wants a bump at their own home Olympics. Um, but the, I mean, the gymnastics, we started pumping money in in the mid nineties to try and get somewhere near the top of gymnastics. And it took till 2012 for it all to come good. So these are not slow. These are not, quick processes to get to the top of these sports and yes you get a, a patriotic bump but yeah the relief on her face I think um, and it just it's those people as well that miss them because of injury as well and you think it's just one moment in time and you only get one shot at a home Olympics in your life if you get one at all and for it to have panned out she just looked like 
relief was, I think, exactly what you saw. The, women, the women's heptathlon was it was even better because you had Katharina jo- Johnson Thompson, uh, in you know, making her kind of debut, as it were. And now, and now she's our girl for the heptathlon, but you know, that was her first kind of appearance. And and the one event that, um, well, no, I mean, there's a couple of events that, that aren't Jess's strong suit, but you know, high jump. She's not, she's not a huge person, but Johnson Thompson is really good at that. So, you know, the, the interest holding uh, was there and also kind of hope for the for the future. Yeah, if it was going to be Ennis's, you know, last Olympics as a serious gold medal contender. Yeah, there's yeah. still good news coming forward as well. John, you get it. Home Olympics, don't you? You've had one in your hometown. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, we, we had uh, Muhammad Ali. That was the plus side. A uh, little bit of a bombing problem. Maybe that was the downside, but we had some really great uh, chicken sandwiches there too. <laughs> Outstanding. On that note, we've got one more to go today, Matt. This better be good. You're like the grand finale. I've actually prepared this one, so I'm not winging it like I normally do. <laughs> um, right. Greatest sporting moment. So the greatest sporting moment happened on a sunny spring day in 1947. The reason I'm putting this forward as the greatest sports moment in history, because it wasn't a come behind from behind win. It wasn't the baggies managing to stay up. It was a cred or an incredible individual achievement or a new world record. It wasn't any of that. It was the way a nation looked at itself changed that that afternoon. The event was when 28 year old Jackie Robinson wearing the number 42 jersey of the Brooklyn Dodgers ran out at Ebbets Field and took his position at first base. It was a moment that changed America, smashed the color barrier, and doomed the Negro baseball leagues to a slow death. Jack Roosevelt Robinson was not the greatest player in the Negro leagues. That was probably Josh Gibson, who would die the year Jackie made his debut, or Buck Leonard, or the incredible Satchel Paige. But Dodgers owner Branch Rickey knew he needed a special kind of player to step over the divide and break the decades-old gentleman agreement in baseball that no black player would play in the white leagues. The old adage is that Robinson was the first player to play in the majors, but that's a complete disservice to the Negro Leagues. They were majors. They had incredible players, and the teams like the Kansas City Monarchs and the Homestead Grays produced some of the greatest ball players that have ever lived. They played more games than the white players. They traveled more miles and they racked up better numbers than some of the greatest white players. This is the crux of it. Baseball is a statistics game. And the important thing to remember is the very greatest players fail seven times out of 10. But to be the first in the white majors, the player needed to be something special. Jackie Robinson was. He was the son of a sharecropper, the grandson of a slave from Cairo, Georgia. Jackie would use his abilities in, and his family to move him to Pasadena, California. Sporting ability was in the Robinson family's blood. Jackie's older brother, Mac, made the 1936 Olympic team and won a silver medal in the 200 meters, finishing just four tenths of a second behind Jesse Owens. Jackie would play baseball, basketball, football, and run track for UCLA, where he'd meet his wife, Rachel. The war would see Jackie drafted and he would join the cavalry. He applied to officer training and it needed heavyweight champ Joe Lewis to go for bat to go to bat for all of the officer candidates whose applications were being held back because of their color. Jackie would complete the course, be commissioned as a second lieutenant in the 761st Black Panthers tank, tank battalion at Fort Hood in Texas. The 761st would go on to win honor in Europe as part of as part of Patton's third army but Jackie would never be deployed because 11 years before Rosa Parks, Jackie refused to go to the back of the bus. He was court-martialed and where, while his, he was never sentenced and he, he got off, it meant he was not going to be posted to Europe. After the war, Jackie signed with the Kansas City Monarchs on $400 a month and played shortstop, hitting a fantastic 349 in his first season. And he was stealing bases for fun, which is an art form in, in and of itself. At the end of that season, Branch Rickey made his move and signed Jackie Robinson to a major league deal with the Dodgers. He spent 1946 in Montreal, but in Jackie, Rickey had seen more than talent. He saw something that he needed to have in a player, he needed someone with grit, determination, and Jackie had that in spades. 
It's interesting. Branch Rickey's remembered for this altruistic move and is sort of held up for it. But Branch Rickey also was a businessman. He didn't pay a dime for Jackie's Monarchs contract, feeling that all Negro players were free agents because they didn't have the right clauses in their contracts. He would get great talent on the cheap, and he would also fill his stadium with New York's black baseball fans. It did come down to money. Jackie would have a less than stellar start to his, his minor league career, and it would take a year for him to come up, but it would all come good for that 1947 season. That afternoon at Ebbets Field would change everything. Baseball is America in many ways, and the summer months are dominated by the game. While it is really just a rehashed version of Rounders, there is something wonderful about it. There are a few sporting events I would love to travel to see in all of time, but to be at Ebbets Field that day to watch Jackie run out is at the top of my list. Jackie would not have a standout game. He'd go 0 for 3 at bat. And while the Dodgers would beat the Braves 5 to 3, and it, it wasn't you know, that great performance, but it was what it stood for. That season would turn out to be an incredible one for Jackie. He'd win Rookie of the Year, and he would spend nine years in the majors, winning the 1955 World season and hitting 311. But it's what Jackie would do. What Branch Rickey saw in him was what made him so special. When Paul Robeson famously said that African Americans wouldn't fight the Soviets in an invasion, it was Jackie Robinson who was called by Joseph McCarthy before the HUAC committee. I'm going to read his statement because it's quite amazing. Not only does he take a smack at Robeson, but he puts things as he sees it. Jackie told Joe McCarthy, I can't speak for any 15 million people any more than any one person can, but I know that I've got too much invested for my wife and child and myself in the future of this country, and I and other Americans of many races and faiths have too much invested in our country's welfare for any of us to throw it away because of a siren song sung in bass. But that doesn't mean that we're going to stop fighting race discrimination in this country until we've got it licked. It means that we're going to fight it all the harder because our stake in the future is so big. We can win our fight without the communists. We don't need their help. It was an incredible statement that left the audience stunned. Unfortunately, he wouldn't always be on the right side of history as he was convinced by Nixon to get his endorsement over JFK. But he would go on to be the first African-American vice president of a major U.S. corporation. And his legacy would go on until he tragically died at the age of only 53 in 1972. But what is the legacy of the 15th of April, 1947? Well, the 15th of April is Jackie Robinson Day. On that day, everyone in baseball, from the officials through all the players, wear number 42 on their back. It's the only time the number is worn in baseball because it has been retired from the entire game in honor of Jackie Robinson. He could have been rubbish. Running out that spring day could have been enough. There was others waiting to follow. Larry Doby was going to be playing with the Cleveland Indians only three months later. The thing was, Jackie Robinson wasn't. He was a bloody good ball player. And Jackie would transcend sport. Branch Rickey would say about him, there was never a man in the game who could put mind and muscle together quicker and with better judgment than Robinson. Does this American sporting moment resonate? It certainly does. Because that veteran of the Black Panther Battalion was then played by the Black Panther himself, Chadwick Boseman, in the movie of his life. Jackie Robinson taking up first base on the 15th of April, 1947 is the greatest sporting moment in history because it's more than a sporting moment. It is history. Uh, you have almost, well, no, you have made me interested in baseball for five whole minutes, which for me, because um, I do refer to it as silly boys rounders, is quite <laughs> exceptional. Uh, we do have one American in the room. John? Yeah, the, uh, uh, the Braves are now with the, uh, in Atlanta. At the time uh, Jackie Robinson was playing, they were in Boston. Uh, it is a, you know, it was a significant turning point in professional sports. Now, there were, of course, other sports that had top-level black athletes. Uh, boxing, we've talked about. Uh, and, in fact, Matt, you mentioned uh, Joe Lewis, the Brown Bomber, who was uh, uh, a bigger, he was bigger during the Second World War than Jackie Robinson was. 
Um, and then eventually that paved the way for people like uh, Hank Aaron and, and other, other players. Uh, that was, that's a big moment and you see it in sport clips a lot as kind of an iconic moment um, and, and a turning point. Marcus, you're impressed by this, aren't you? Well, you've definitely got me on the Black Panther tanks. Uh, really up for that. And it was wonderfully told, really nicely told. And uh, I'm very impressed by the story. Um, the only thing is, I actually think his, his life's more impressive than the sporting moment. Uh, genuinely like a, a very impressive guy. I have sat through uh, a whole match of baseball in America. Uh, in San Francisco, and I have to say, like the atmosphere, yeah, I get the atmosphere. The food's amazing, the beer's amazing, but I have no idea why they hit the ball a really long way, walk slowly round, everyone cheers. There's a lot of stats on on the screen, and some really nice people did try to explain it to me, and I tried to pay attention, and I did not know what was going on. I really wanted them to run. I guess the equivalent would be like it would be like. Premier League footballers just walking the ball around. Uh, they were so good at like hitting the ball, they don't no longer needed to run anymore because they, they hit it such a long the way. Inject all steroids in their upper body; they can't run. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I was really surprised at watching these people who are like Super League, whatever they call it, hit the ball and it goes so far they can just walk all the way around. When I all I remember of uh, rounders at school is hitting the ball a little way and then like having to sprint to the first one and then slide along the floor, but. Yeah, I'm, I was massively sold on uh, the life of Jackie and uh, the sporting achievements he did. That was very impressive. The point about baseball is it's their cricket, which means that it's not about the sport. It's about getting drunk with your friends and eating a lot. Yeah, yeah I remember having some really good like veggie hot dog thing and fries with chilies on top and uh, quite a few beers in the sunshine. And they bring um, it to so, you at your yeah, seat. Can get that. <laughs> so, Alex, yeah. when you have the cricket over here, you don't worry about the eating part. No, fuck no. <laughs> only to line your stomach at the beginning maybe i remember my dad's call box leaving for uh, a day out at lords and it would be 95 percent beer the great thing about the cricket is the bar is open when the first bar is the first bowl is bowled so everyone watches the first ball and buggers off down to the bar that's where it should be hmm. wait wait you wait till the game starts to open your bars yes because <laughs> technically the it's sort of wow. just about 11 o'clock in the morning so it, it you're not right. supposed to well, be no, drinking. It, it, at cricket, you're allowed to bring a little hamper of booze with you, aren't you? So the the the, the skill is to bring a you know a, a reasonably well stocked. I mean, if it's, if it's test match, you don't need to watch every ball anyway. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> John's just like John can't process this. He's like, you fucking amateurs. If this was America, they'd open the bar <laughs> at six in the morning. I, I once went to a T20 game at the Oval a couple of years ago, and it was it, it was rained off, so the start was delayed for an hour or so. And it, I saw the last over in the end. <laughs> I, I've, I've, I've been corporate for T20 at the Oval, and it's one of the most boozy experiences I've ever been to in my life. Anyways, we're, we're off subject. We Zach, are. T- tell, tell us about how wonderful I just was. Yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, it's, it's like, Marcus, it's, it's hard to kind of argue with it, other than, you know, as, as you've kind of said yourself, all the steroids go into the upper part of the body, and so therefore there's not much other than can you smack a ball out of the park, in, in which, which is day, great. I mean, there's skill involved in that, but mm, I'd agree with Marcus. It's it's his life as a whole that's such a, an incredible story, as opposed to a, a specific moment. But the life makes the moment, because it probably couldn't have been someone else to put up with what he did for those years in that league the context is what he's yeah. saying um guys have you i mean i think pretty much sure if you've uh, ruled out anyone who mentioned football already uh, but you've been diligently in conversation all night do you know which way you're going to go well we have disagreement about this marcus you want me to do yeah. third place do third place and we're disagreeing on the top top two but i think we've got an agreement Okay, so in third place, mainly because I've twisted Marcus's arm into this, we're going Kate with Bob Champion and Aldeniti. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'd actually said Holmes. Um, I, I like I like Kate, but I was actually you know a bit of military history thrown in there. But hey ho, uh, horse horse and his friends. It's a lovely Disney story. It is indeed. So, what have you been rowing about? 
rowing about second place uh, immensely, like the married couple that we basically are. <laughs> um, so in the end, we've gone second place, uh, Amelia and Kit, for <laughs> the long distance running. I don't know if he's still there. I am, I'm um, sorry. So I the head is... Okay, cool. Um, so the long distance running with coughing up blood, amputees, champagne, and uh, fainting and almost dying in the middle had all the drama of a great sporting moment, especially the fact it was basically just quite a clusterfuck. You say um, all of that, but really the winning wrong. thing for Zach is the guy getting a cab for part of it. Yes, it absolutely is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that he had the sense to get in a cab because he couldn't it's be off. way to, do a, to run a race. It's, I think it's the only reason I'll run more than a mile and a half is the idea of some champagne at the end. Though. <laughs> Outstanding. And who's your winner? And our winner on, is Zach. Charlie and the Rumble in the Jungle. Yes, oh. undefeated. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the champion of the world. <laughs> Largely for all of it, all of um, Ali's, you know, um, civil rights movements and everything going on with the context of it. But it is such a legacy that even though I haven't actually, unfortunately, seen the footage of Rumble in the Jungle, it is so legendary that you say that and everyone knows the sporting moment that it is. So, yeah. I- Spin off from that as well, John. Um, you were talking about when he turned up at the opening ceremony in, in Atlanta just the response for this sort of frail man. Yeah, he, he was uh, dying of Parkinson's at that point, but he uh, released the, he, he lit the Olympic torch at the very end and the stadium just went nuts at uh, when the spotlight showed down on him. So he, he did stand for a lot like uh, conscientious objections, civil rights, sort of like yeah. Jackie Robinson did. Uh, but he was also the bona fide world champion and with an extremely uh, high level of talent and boxing IQ. Uh, I'm pretty sure my dad cried when he lit that flame, actually. And I'm, I remember thinking, what the fuck is all this about? Uh, a, lot of, a lot of people did. Yeah. That was, there's, uh, a, there's a great movie called Facing Ali, which is all the surviving guys that fought him talking about what it meant and what it was like fighting him. Um, and they're all very complimentary, except for Joe Fraser, who who absolutely hates him. Joe Fraser paid Ali's bills when he got out of prison. Mm-hmm. Ali called him an Uncle Tom. And so Joe basically just spent three fights trying to kill him and then spent the rest of his life taking credit for the Parkinson's. Can I, can I just point out that it's a great story, and I'll give you a worthy winner, but proper experienced judges don't get influenced by sound effects. I think <laughs> <laughs> Seconded. Yes. Like, like, yes. yeah, yeah. uh, Very candidate type thing. Well, let's fight. So, if, <laughs> Holmes, if you were judging, which one of you would you have gone for if you couldn't have yours? Um, it, to be fair, it would have been. It, I was going almost all the way with Rumble in the Jungle, but I think being British, and it's probably not a historical event either, but I'd probably have to go with uh, Super Saturday. Yeah, I was quite, I think, because we remember it. Although Matt moved me quite a lot, and I was surprised because I generally go with the line that baseball's shit. Uh, Charlie, if you couldn't have had Rumble in the Jungle. I, I would have gone with Matt. I thought that was a really great story. And, you know, it. yes, his life was more remarkable after that event, but, you know, it was it was stepping out and doing that. Although Chris used the buzzwords of patriarchy and masochism, <laughs> and I wondered if you would have gone for Chris's. It always works. It always works on me every time. And, uh, you know, if, if a bicycle one had, had won, I've actually got a bicycle bell here as well, so, which we could have used. So. <laughs> <laughs> Made Clive happy. Clive, who would you have gone for? For Beth, obviously. There was no other choice, was there? No, I just, I'd still think, still think. <laughs> The Battle of the Bridge is one of my all-time. Yeah, but obviously that would have been... It wasn't or, a battle. Or Munich 2012. Oh, it was, Marcus, it was. Matt? To be fair, I would have gone for, for Charlie. Um, everyone was great. To be fair, I was in Canada when Super Super Saturday was happening. So we, we were kind of... <laughs> I took the good sense to go abroad during the Olympics. Um, but, you know, that 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 whole sequence... Yeah, because it was yeah that was the third of four of possibly the greatest boxing fights of all time, and just the drama around it is just something else. You so, are essentially one of these weirdo people in Canada that prefers the Winter Olympics, anyway, aren't you? Which do we even? It's, it's the only one that matters. 
There's only one. Yeah. There's only one sport that matters, and unfortunately, the Americans beat us in it the other night. Passes. Oh, is this ice hockey? No. Yeah, I, they, I, they I, won the World Juniors, I so everybody's it. upset. I don't know what happened to James, but uh, he was banned <laughs> from ice hockey. Beth, who would you have gone for? Um, I think I've probably gone with Lockie's Super Saturday because it was just such a brilliant day. Like I can remember it so, so like it's so vivid in my head. You just can't not remember what you were doing and how you felt. So yeah. Yeah, sheer fucking relief for Jessica Ennis as well when she crossed the line. Yeah. If you couldn't have had Super Saturday. Um, I really like the first FA Cup final. Actually, I thought that was a good, that was a good story, and it kind of it, it ties in with some of my um you know, kind of early rugby club stuff as well, because there was a time before association football split with r- rugby football. And, you know, all the old rugby clubs are, are known as football clubs, really. I mean, Black Blackie Football Club, Leicester Football Club. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I, I kind of like that tying with a lot of stuff that I know. And I like the story and I like the development from it. Excellent. Kit says, cricket is a picnic with someone throwing a rock at poshos. I don't think you're <laughs> far wrong. But, Kit, what would you have gone for if you couldn't have had your mad marathon? Gone for bets actually because I think the thing about sport is that it's so personal that the moments that resonate with you aren't necessarily big moments for anybody else and that's yeah. certainly with me so just because even though West Bromwich Albion made a load of old shit um, <laughs> you know I will go with that yeah, it's like it's not all about the winning. Like my Battle of the Bridge moment is about finishing tenth that year in the Premier League. But the point is, we made Spurs. It's, it's not, not about, about the taking part. Clive, give that speech again. It's not about the winning. It's not about the taking part. It's about the other bastard losing. Yeah, yes. Was on that. Uh, John, you were sold on boxing from the very beginning, weren't you? I, I was. Although I'll tell you. If I weren't going to go with uh, Rumble in the Jungle, I think I'd go with Super Saturday for two mm-hmm. reasons. One, it has something for everyone because basically we heard about half the sports played at the at the Summer Olympics. And second, I was really waiting for Lockheed to give us a story about uh, uh, the new who's the the New Zealand uh, All Blacks uh, captain. Uh, he got his his scrotum but came back onto the field oh. and, uh, and 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 uh, played the game, losing four teeth until uh, he, they they stitched him up a little bit. Until the Colin Mead story, yeah, uh, it's, it's it's got an old school one, that isn't it? But yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> disappointment on Lockie's face for not going with that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Chris, have you provided your? Who's your winner? Uh, um, well, I, I was kind of tempted by how because a good chunk of my family were royal engineers um but i'm i'm, I'm probably gonna have to go with kate I, I really quite like that story about how everybody nearly died but still went on to win it, it's kind of the uh gillingham dream of we're really crap but we can do this and so yeah i, I, I i'm gonna go with kate brilliant kate that nobody wins it's just there. yeah <laughs> It's a, do you know, what's that film, Remember the Titans, where you watch it for two fucking hours and then it just comes up at the end that they didn't win? And you're like, what? <laughs> what? Dillingham season. <laughs> but you get it with Cool Runnings. You know that's coming because you know they didn't finish the race. But Remember the Titans, it's like you're following this damn football team through everything and then it goes uh, and then they went to the state final and they didn't win. And you're like, hang on, what? I've invested two hours of my life in this show. <laughs> Kate. Um, I actually... I, I really like Super Saturday. It was a, a good idea. Um, I like the, the kind of whatever, but I think I would have to go with Catherine Switzer because it was, it was just a, an actual single moment that was so great. And then she repeated that single moment, I think like 50 years later or something when she was in her seventies, which is just amazing. Alina, were you moved by any of those? You've been beavering away getting ready for interviews next week. You know, I thought Zach's choice was incredibly inspiring. Zach. Zach. What was Zach's choice? Um, the one about... Um... Zach was judging, Alina. <laughs> what? Stop. I'm sorry, James. James. James's choice. James's choice. James isn't here. <laughs> then... <laughs> Someone else is. Cho- I don't. Uh, wow, you are Lockie's really choice was the best. Lockie. <laughs> I was fucking saying. Lockie's choice after that shit. 
<laughs> Look, he's got a bronze backhand. That might be true. There might have been a Polish shot putter that got a bronze in the afternoon on Super Saturday that we've completely forgotten about. <laughs> exactly. Uh, like, it would have had to be a pole vaulter. Lockie looks so offended at that. The best, that. Like, the best I can do is a, is a Lithuanian um, heptathlete who was uh, who pushed Jess Ennis quite close in the uh, women's heptathlon. Have that. And in case you didn't realise, Alina wasn't listening to any of them whatsoever. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, we have next week, uh, hopefully we'll get Simon London back, we are going to do the worst history film ever i'm trying to steer people away from just doing military history again because we did have a chat about crappy war films when we did war films uh, there's already some great ones coming out um, and what's even funnier is that home is result holmes who will be back in his judging seat next week is resolving himself to try and sit through them honestly D- das boot would be like the sweet trolley turning up now basically <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's, it's bizarre, from what, from what I've seen so far, Lockie's, Lockie's nomination for worst film is way better than his nomination for best film. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you know I'm what just it, waiting it, for Alex to do Bridgerton. Oh, don't Bridgerton. Just <laughs> fucking do one. Oh, my God. We will rant about that next week without any doubt. I'll just read my tweets out on it because I stand by every single one of them. Mother of God.